Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is to review and approve minutes. Uh, there are none. Second item on the agenda is to sign bills. No bills. We have no bills. And on to meetings and hearings. Um, we have a couple that are going to be continued to our next meeting, which is May 16th. I'll read them now. The first one, which is going to be continued, is the continued public hearing regarding notice intent filed by Ezek Petri, 1900 West Park Drive, Suite 180 Westboro, for the construction of a residential multifamily housing complex consisting of 300 units, clubhouse, and some more supporting amenities mm -hmm. and infrastructure at 33 and 69 Green Street. That is continued. To what date? The 16th of May. May 14th, I'm sorry. 14th? Um, the next one, which is continued to May 14th, is the uh, con uh, re continued public hearing regarding the request for amended order condition filed by Rashid Sheikh, 24 Sherrill Drive, Shrewsbury, for the construction of two single family houses at 20, 22 uh, Greylock Ave, formerly 37, 39 Melvin Ave, and 42 so, uh, Sadler Ave. That is also continued. Okay. First, um, Continued public hearing regarding the notice of intent filed by Bob Mahata, 46 Deerfield Road, Shrewsbury, for the construction of a single family home and driveway at 5 Flanagan Drive. Good evening, Brian Waterman from WDA Design Group. Um, on behalf of Mr. Mahatra. See this? Or you want me to move it yeah, I guess if you could move it over over here, it'd be better, right? Next to you. Great. Right. Okay. Yep. So the initial uh, hearing for this was in February. Um, we didn't have DEP comments at the time. Um, the commission had comments on uh, some of the construction sequencing, um, other notes uh, regarding retained walls. Uh, there are also questions on could we change the house or garage design uh, and some of the driveway to minimize work within the riverfront area. Um, and since that time, we did did receive the cut P comments. Uh, one of their comments was uh, in regard to utilizing the subsurface infiltrator um, or we had uh, discussed doing rain gardens. Um, either one is looked at as an infiltration system of, of sorts. One is obviously on the surface, one is underground. Um, and they also brought up uh, doing performing a soil test uh, from the rain garden. Um, in that time, we did uh, have our soil evaluator uh, perform an additional soils test on number seven and number five, um, which we uh, coordinated with uh, Aaliyah and Vincent Tai from the town. But um, so the significant change: um, the original proposal was for over 7,100 square feet of disturbance. Um, we did a second revision um, that dropped it down to 6,400. And now we've tightened up some of these walls. We've gone to two rain gardens instead of the larger mm -hmm. subsurface infiltration system. Uh, added another slight wing wall off the back of the house. And we're, that allows us to pull in uh, the disturbance in the back even greater. And now the total disturbance is reduced uh, down to 6,000 square feet. Um, the major change, uh, they removed one of the uh, garage bays, so it's now not a double two-car garage, it's a single-car garage. Um, that allowed us to shift, you know, the, the development portion on this side uh, farther to the east 
and uh, slide the driveway a bit. So uh, there have been some significant changes in that regard. Um, why we, we were out doing the soil testing, we had a machine on number seven because number seven is an active site. Um, <coughs> but given the, um, the existing sidewalk at the front of the site here and it's rather steep and we already have erosion control for number seven, we decided to dig this uh, soil test by hand um, and not disturb that area with a machine at this point. Um, we've added the uh, soil test pit data on the front sheet. Um, and again, we've changed the design from the larger subsurface infiltration system um, to two surface rain gardens, one in the rear, one in the front. Um, both these are designed with uh, the greater than two foot minimum separation to groundwater. Um, since we're below, uh, we're within four feet of groundwater, we'll have to run a groundwater mounting analysis. Uh, our engineer wasn't, uh, was away and was not able to run that prior to tonight's meeting. But we've done a lot of these systems uh, and even for subsurface infiltrators that are much larger than this and we haven't had an impact with the groundwater mounting analysis. So we don't anticipate one for these uh, surface rain gardens. Um, so we show a detail here for the rain gardens along with the planting detail, the species. We have a, uh, a rain garden sign that we've utilized on other rain gardens for single family projects in other towns um, that would be placed outside the edges to let uh, landscape companies and others know that uh, this isn't something they mow and treat as a lawn or other area. So, um, so there's been significant changes. Um, again, this was filed under 1058-4D, which is part of the Rivers Protection Act, um, which allows for lots that were created prior to the Rivers Protection Act that have certain configuration parameters that uh, don't allow you to meet uh, the full extent of the regulation. So you have to meet it to the maximum extent practicable. Um, and by reducing the amount of work uh, by over 1,100 square feet from what was originally proposed, reducing the size of the garage and the shifting things to the east as far as we could, um, and adding the rain gardens, um, we feel that we've addressed the comments uh, that the commission had in the initial meeting, ones we've received uh, since that time from DEP and additional correspondence with Aaliyah uh, and Mr. Ty in between that time and now. So I'll turn it over to the commission. So uh, one of the DEP comments, I believe, it's, it says that, um, you know, garages and decks and other things don't, don't qualify. Is that, is that true? Well, what, what they're saying is, you mean don't qualify as part of the Rivers Protection Act or the? As, as something that you would need to, you can build the house, but it, you right. need to have these structures as well, part of What she was saying is that uh, the market value is really not part of their purview, but asking someone to um, reduce it to the point of essentially doing a taking without compensation, um, but um, I mean, that's a significant change in this market is, is going to a one-car garage. And they've gone to the, the smallest footprint on the house. It's a 35 by 35. Um, so, right, they're not proposing to build a, you know, 5,000 square foot house or footprint on the, on the property. So they have significantly reduced it. All right. Um, all right, uh, anybody, uh, Diane? Oh, well, I was gonna say the same thing. Okay. Uh, I was gonna say that um, what is grandfathered in is the house and the driveway. Um, beyond that, the garage, a yard, any appurtenances, they're not grandfathered in. Right, well, you mean, we've reduced the yards 
you know, the way the regulation reads is to the maximum practical, which is mi minimizing the yard around the house, which we've done by the walls. I mean, you have to have enough room to actually construct something. Um, and we've reduced that. Uh, this is 20 scale. Um, so the backyard, that's only 20 feet deep. Um, the side yard to the property line. We've pushed the house as far as we can to the zoning setback. Um, so we've pulled this in. The, the closest portion of the erosion control barrier here is, is 62 feet from the wetland. Uh, the corner of the house is at 86 feet. <coughs> Uh, the corner of the garage is 83 feet to the river. Um, Which the, so, I mean, we've minimized it significantly. But it, I'm sorry, I don't know which corner of the garage you're referring to. Um, right here it says on the map that almost all the garages <coughs> within the 100 foot um, inner riparian. <coughs> right, it is. Yeah. This back corner, oops, sorry. This back corner is 83, so there's 17 feet from that corner to the 100-foot riverfront. The entire lot is within the riverfront, based on this current mapping. Okay. I'm all set. Yep. Uh, um, I have a question. I'm not sure if anybody here can answer, but. It, you are correct in that pulling it back to a one-car garage is unusual in this market. What would be, um, suppose a homeowner wanted to add a garage, what would be the process for that? Would they be told, no, you can't? Or you mean after the, after the fact? After the fact. Right. Well, DEP has suggested that they put a deed restriction, uh, if this is approved, which says... Uh, you know, there's 6,000 square feet that was approved, so there'd be a deed restriction not allowing further. Um, there is debate on whether or not this stream, you know, it's shown on a USGS map that was created. This was, was probably 83 or 85. Just shows a solid blue line, but everything else supporting it, which we can't utilize under current DP regulations, saying, you know, the drainage area and things, the size of the culvert, nothing supports that this is a perennial stream except someone mapped it, you know, when they read a map in 1985 that they drew a blue line. So that's kind of a weird one because if, if this dries, they could file to amend to remove the riverfront. <laughs> um, but right now we have to deal with it as if it, you know, with the rainfall we had last year and to this year, last year you weren't, you weren't going to confirm I mean, this thing was almost dry, and then we got all the rain, so I couldn't, I couldn't submit all the photos. So, um, but yes, under the way it's filed, with dealing with it as a perennial stream in the riverfront, and what DEP has suggested is, if you guys approve it, that there is note or a deed restriction that says that's the maximum riverfront that can be done on the lot. Okay, thank you. Yep, Chris. <clears throat> No questions, but wouldn't if they if somebody wanted to build a garage, they'd have to come before this commission anyway, right? Oh yeah, any future work would have to right. be filed. We'd be consistent with what we're saying tonight. Right. But yeah, I have no other questions. Yeah. Uh, right, any any work, <clears throat> and you know, if the riverfront were to disappear, this is still the hundred foot buffer zone. Um, so either way, anyone that tried to do anything else in the future is going to have to come back to you. Um, and if there's a deed restriction in the riverfront, you know, if the stream is still flowing, you're going to say, well, <laughs> sorry, there's no more work allowed within the riverfront. Andy? I'm all set. Elia? I'm all set. Okay. Anybody from the audience have any questions? Just have a quick Just come right up to the podium, please. Thank you. 97 Francis. We need to speak at the podium. Do you want me to speak at yeah. the podium? Yeah. yeah. So the mic can capture you. There Absolutely. You <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'll be really quick. Um, first of all, just um, I guess one question I have is if this is approved to 500, I'm, I'm sorry, 5,000, and the lot is, as I think the commission mentioned last time, really tricky, right? 
why would we approve this for over 5,000, right? Why do we need to allow for a one-car garage when we know this is a really tricky lot with a lot of restrictions? And there's already been a lot of building on the hillside. And, it, and it's a stream that was not declassified. It was attempted to be declassified, but it is still a wetland. So I guess my question would be, why do yeah. we need to go over 5,000 on this? Good for her. For a one-car garage for a family that doesn't live there yet. Well, they're, they're building a house to try to live there. <laughs> uh, and the the regulations allow for over 5,000 um, under a lot that was created prior to the Rivers Protection Act. It, it allows, but it doesn't have to be yet. No. You, Correct. You, you minimize it to the maximum extent feasible, mm -hmm. um, which is what we've attempted to do. Um, and no, the stream has not been declassified. We're treating as it is a perennial stream. Um, and, you know, I don't know if I have the aerial photo. You know, you can see, and this is only a small section, but you can see the stream here. You can, the number of houses that are within uh, 30 to 50 feet of this stream that have been developed over the course of since what the 60s or whatever um, is far greater I mean we we this proposed house on lot five has a greater setback to the river than the majority of the houses that are already built there um, you know and the, yeah. the slope off the back of these houses is you know 20 to 30 feet and there's debris drum, dumped down there it's so these would, guys are now building under the new regulations, so they have to meet a much higher performance standard. Erosion controls, the retaining walls. Um, oh, <clears throat> I would su suggest uh, maybe look at it and see if you can get down to that 5,000 square foot threshold. Ooh. I see. You have to come back next month anyway because you still need some soil <laughs> samples. Is that correct? No, we, we did the You soil. did those? Yeah. You're all set? Yeah. Yeah, Leah was, was there when we were, we hand dug the one on five. And seven was with machine. And, and we took the feedback from, from last month. We substantially reduced. From but not all. We not, you didn't take all the feedback from the DEP because they're saying, you know, we read it earlier about the, you, you don't need a, uh, a garage. You don't need some of these other things. So if you eliminate the garage, you would be at the 5,000 pretty close to the 5,000 square foot threshold. <coughs> uh, and the garage is only 12 by 22, so it's only a couple hundred square feet. Um, what what uh, the DEP reviewer wrote, uh, construction of single family home, septic system, and driveway, where the oh. shape of the lot within the riverfront area prevents construction from meeting the requirements. Um, our, uh, the performance standards are met to the maximum feasible what she's saying is the provision does not state that a house must meet a marketable value, but rather allows for a house driveway to enter and exit the lot and the septic. We don't have a septic. Yards and garages and other appurtenants would not qualify. Uh, the commission should consider stormwater features, which we've gone to the rain gardens. Um, we've done the soil testing. Uh, she also wrote, if the commission finds the project approvable, the commission should include a perpetual condition and a deed restriction that memorializes the limit of alteration to the riverfront area. And then under 1058-4D, uh, which is the regulation for <coughs> lots that were created prior to the Rivers Protection Act that are challenging to, due to layout or lot configuration um, it says the issuing authority shall allow the construction of a single family house septic if no sooner than riverfront area prevents the construction from meeting the requirements provided that the lot can be developed for such purposes under applicable provisions of other municipal and state law it's a buildable lot by area and frontage um, it says in difficult siting situations, which you have here, obviously, the maximum extent of yards around houses shall be limited to the area necessary for construction. So 
like I said, here we have five feet, and then you've got a wall, and then a three to one slope. Here you've got four feet, and then you've got a wall, and you've got <coughs> 20 feet off the back, and the side is at 15 feet, and then we've tucked the rain guards in. So we have minimized the yards. So um, I mean, without I, I don't know if anyone wants a house that uh, these days that doesn't have a garage. I guess. <laughs> and we initially had we initially had two garage of a bigger size, and based on the feedback from from the board, we went back. We revised it to a smaller one garage. We have houses they need garage at least one. Um, so we try to incorporate. I think Brian, if uh, the house is within five thousand, it's the yard a little bit that goes. Well, it's just it's any disturbance. So right. it's it's cr you know you just think of it as you know this line around we're in here doing clearing or grading, and we're doing all electric, no natural gas, and we took the infiltration system out and we put the rain garden, um, and. Uh, the feedback was to bring the retaining wall, put attach it to that. We we did that. Re, we engineered, got the engineered retaining walls stamped. Um, we did submit the Versalock retaining wall, the engineered plans that you requested for both five and seven. Diane, do you have something? Um, I just wanted to respond to what you said about um, the houses along Francis Ave. They are. Uh, much closer than they would ever be allowed right now. Um, but that was 50 years ago. I know. And in the 50 years since then, we've learned an awful lot about the value of wetlands. Oh, I, I agree. So it's a, it's a different picture. And in addition, um, yeah, last year was a very rainy year. <clears throat> so far, this year is pretty rainy, not as yeah, rainy as last inches year. we're over normal right now. Right. So what's normal is changing. Absolutely. Since 1980, the amount of precipitation here has increased by 60 percent, and it's, inc it's, it's increasing. Mm -hmm. So year by year, even though there are years of drought or years of what we might call normal rain, all told, the amount of precipitation is increasing year by year. Right. right. Yeah, DEP is changing the stormwater you know, storm, right. storm events and things. Right, so uh, a riverfront like this actually has value mm -hmm. that wasn't understood in 1969. Right. And I think we're trying to protect that value. Like I said, we, we're keeping it 85 to 86 feet away from the stream. Um, you know, much greater, a double than what some of the other houses. <coughs> um, that they are already done. This is. This I is agree. The one but the regulations do allow it. I, you know, we've been hired to, to design it, uh, and we've reduced it significantly. But uh, you guys have to feel comfortable in approving or or not. So. Any other questions? So do you want us to close the hearing? Did you want to complete the groundwater the, 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 the groundwater mounding analysis prior to closing? You um, that yeah, or we could submit. Uh, if you close, then we can't submit new information. So yeah, I guess we would have to leave it open and submit it. Okay, okay. I, I don't think it's going to change, but we can certainly do that. Yeah, so we could keep it open till when's your next meeting? May May fourteen. May fourteen. Yeah, our engineer will be, I think he's back out again because of the school vacation, but uh, it's a pretty quick run once they hop in the program, so. Um. What, just to entertain the commission, what would a comparison, how much square footage would in total would be disturbed if the garage was removed? Well, the garage is 12 by 22. What's that, 240-something square feet? Okay. Um, but you so you'd go from 6,000 down to about 5,800. So that doesn't get you all the way anyhow. And like I said, the house is 35 by 35. It's not an enormous 
footprint, especially for Shrewsbury. But um, and this is the this is the smallest house that we have. We're building on that lot. Okay. All right. So we'll see you next month. Yep. May fourteenth. Thank you. Well, we we'll have another one, don't you? Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 You ready? We have a new public hearing regarding the request for an amended order of conditions filed by Bob Mahaltra, 46 Deerfield Road, Shrewsbury, for the construction of a single family house and driveway at 7 Flanagan Drive. Let's see, that wasn't the legal notice. For the construction of retaining walls and elevation rays of a single family home and driveway at 7 Flanagan Drive. Okay. All set. What do we got, Mike? Um, so on number seven, this was uh, this project is under the order of conditions uh, DEP file number two eight five one nine seven nine. Um, the foundation is in. The, the driveway is roughed in. Um, the off grading. Um, they had raised, as we outlined in the uh, March informal discussion, uh, they had raised the house about five to six feet um, in order to, this was originally a E1 pump system for the sewer. Um, and I guess in discussions with the town, they suggested they would rather, much rather have gravity. So if you raised it, uh, Bob didn't see the problem with raising this. You know, we didn't expand the horizontal approved limits work. Came up. They've since created the gravity sewer tie into the street. Um, so we had proposed uh, in discussions in March that we needed to file for an amended order for the change in elevation. Um, and we designed the walls. Uh, on the plan, which obviously is a change. Um, but the wall, as I think as we outlined in the informal, the bottom of the wall uh, at the back here, the base of the wall is at elevation 560, yeah. which was the original approved off grading limit. But now they've raised this, raised this up. We built a four foot uh, retaining wall here um, to contain the off grading. So again, the, the horizontal limits or the, the bottom grade did not change, but they did come up, you know, vertically. Um, uh, the one uh, the one thing with the change on this, uh, with raising it, they were able to straighten the the driveway before that used to curve down. So there's actually a, a reduction in the impervious area of approximately 600 square feet. Um, so that's a net benefit from the raise. Um, we did have our soil evaluator uh, perform a test pit in the back here. Through the, so you went through the fill and then into the parent material. Um, we found redox uh, and groundwater at about 18 inches. So the system has been redesigned um, to be more than four and a half feet above the groundwater. Um, we've added the soil, test logs. Um, so the amendment was for the raise that happened and for the new retaining wall, um, but maintains the limit of work and shows the reduction in the, uh, in the driveway. So the redu reduced, excuse me, impervious area. So the uh, amendment wouldn't change the extent, the, the uh, duration of the order of conditions. It would just be to allow for the walls, um, indicate the raised home, 
and the uh, change on the driveway. I'll turn over to you. I don't have any questions right now. Martha? All set. You all set? Yes. All set. Andy? Yeah. Leia? This, um, the erosion control won't have to be pushed out any to, for the installation of these. No, they actually, and I, I guess I should bring up, I'm sorry, I forget about that. We added, after following a site walk, um, they've added a second row of erosion control barrier at the back there. Um, and we did have some material that bypasses the sill fence. We've done a, a hand and bucket clean up on that. Um, there were some boulders that went over the fence. I believe you've had some of you guys tossing them back over. Um, but we did a hand and bucket clean up on that as, as well as part of uh, lot number nine. So, verbally, to your, to your question, we will not take the machines there. We will have, we'll do that with the, um, with the manual effort. And we won't have to remove the um, F fence that we have installed. Okay. We won't, won't disturb that. Okay. In case we have to do anything, we will notify you and Vincent prior to do anything. But we do not anticipate anything on that. And I think last time I was out there, um, you were thinking of putting some conservation, uh, conservation seed mix down on the. I think Brian, you ordered that wet spot. <clears throat> yes, we're going to order. A, um, conservation seed mix for that area. Okay. I kind of wanted, you know, one that grows up. Let's see what's there. I know we have breakout in that area, but. Yeah. Um, right below the erosion control that's currently installed, there's been a nice little crop of skunk cabbage coming up. Yeah. So it has been pretty consistently wet since since construction began. Yeah, um, just pushed it up. So yeah, one of the <laughs> conditions might be to just kind of, yeah, there seed cool. some. Yeah. Just to yeah, confirm that. Yeah, I can order that tomorrow, and we'll have it. You know, we'll, we'll notify week. you once it is in there. What's that? I think so. Yeah. Anybody in the audience have any questions? You guys, all set. All right. I guess um, there are no other questions. We can close it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> hey, we have a continued public hearing regarding a notice of intent uh, filed by 160 Holden Street LLC and GFI Partners LLC. 133 Pearl Street, Suite 300, Boston, for the construction of two warehouse buildings and associated drives, loading docks, parking areas, and associated site work at 142. Do you want presenters up at the podium as well, or does just the uh, audience? There should be, there. be a, um, a microphone in there. Oh, right there. there. So you okay, can, great. You're welcome to sit. i told I talked too loud anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I will stop sharing, so you should be able to present with me. So we're putting yep. that up. All right. So I'm Rich Kirby from LEC Environmental Consultants, and we filed the notice of intent for the two warehouses proposed at uh, 142 Clinton Street, which is being subdivided off of 160 Holden Street, the current Worcester Sand and Stone property. With me tonight, the applicant uh, Haley Palazzola and project engineer Doug Harnett from High Point Engineering. So. Sorry, Rich. Oh, on go ahead. I, I don't have the ability to share. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So we filed this notice of intent February 2nd. This is our second public hearing. Since the last public hearing, we had an opportunity, some of the commission members, to visit the site. Uh, we parked along the site entrance at uh, Clinton Street, walked amongst the piles of fill and aggregate, other things. We viewed the wetland resource areas. We saw the proposed uh, buffer zone uh, restoration and enhancement areas on the property and just got a better sense, I think, of the extent of uh, the existing alteration at the site, but also what's being proposed. So while Haley is pulling that up, um, we did prepare a response to comments letter dated April 10th, which basically overviewed the comments and discussion at the first public hearing. 
and we'll be we've incorporated uh, those talking points into our PowerPoint presentation tonight. Uh, we'll be talking about the work in the buffer zone, uh, site disturbance numbers, some plan updates, uh, as well as phosphorus and the waiver request. The um, <laughs> the DEP also issued their comments, um, which talk a little bit about work in the buffer zone, which we'll be addressing. Um, I think we have addressed it in large part in the application and our subsequent letter, but we'll take a look at those comments specifically and tie our proposed mitigation and work in the buffer zone to that specific regulation that they cite. And they also have some relatively minor stormwater comments that have been incorporated into a revised plan set that was submitted to you today. Obviously, we're not going to be going over those. They were submitted to you today. We'll be going over those at the next hearing, but just kind of giving you a heads up as to, as to where we're at. So this first slide is an aerial view of the existing site. You can see the sand and gravel operation roughly within the um, plan north is to the right. So toward the top of the uh, toward the top of the screen there is to the west so within the western uh, portion of the site and some wooded wetlands within the eastern portion of the site that border on Newton Pond um, again this is the hundred point five acres that's being subdivided from the hundred and twenty or so acre larger property 160 Holden Street the hundred and uh, hundred point five acres will be um, 142 Clinton Street next slide please so this is just sort of an overview of the proposed development. You have two warehouses uh, totaling 921,728 square feet. Uh, access roads, three of them provided from Clinton Street. We have an internal access ways. We have employee parking in front of the buildings, between the buildings and Clinton Street, uh, and trailer parking and loading docks on either side of the buildings. The green areas that you see represent uh, lawn and landscape land, as well as the uh, stormwater infiltration systems, which Doug will be talking about in a little bit. Most of this work is outside the buffer zone and within the footprint of the existing sand and gravel operation. The next slide shows a plan that we submitted with the notice of intent that uh, highlights some of these wetland and buffer zone areas where work is being proposed. Again. Plan, uh, plan view toward the top is west, north is to the right. So along Clinton Street, there is a, uh, a wetland there that in large part functions to collect stormwater runoff from Clinton Street and surrounding land. Um, and then toward, toward, the, uh, toward the east, the wetlands that border on Newton Pond sort of meander in and out of the, uh, of the woods along the edge of the existing developed um, sand and gravel uh, area. Now at the last hearing, the commission had requested that we provide 20 scale plans that sort of zoom into these areas so you can better and more clearly see the works that's being proposed within the 15 and 30 foot buffer zones. The next slide, the next, slide, the next couple of slides sort of gets into that. Um, <clears throat> these areas we viewed specifically at the site visit and all of these areas are either currently disturbed with uh, internal access roads associated with the facility or if they are vegetated, sparsely so, with uh, largely invasive exotic plants. Um, here you have the wetland that's along Clinton Street. We're currently evaluating that to determine if it qualifies as a certifiable vernal pool. It's, it's mapped as a potential vernal pool. So far we haven't seen or observed any um, evidence of amphibian breeding activity in there, but we'll be continue to, continuing to monitor it through the hydro period. There's work proposed within the uh, pro proximity of the wetland boundary in two places, to the right or to the north. That's the area for the, um, for the proposed access road, uh, one of them extending from Clinton Street. It was one of the first places we looked at at the site visit. We saw a berm of stone and then a, a vegetated slope descending toward the, uh, quite steeply toward the, um, toward the stream channel that directs surface water from Clinton Street into the wetland. Uh, and then toward the bottom left there, you can see we have a retaining wall proposed 
Um, that area is, is vegetated, sparsely so, largely with uh, some ground cover plants and there are a handful of uh, trees um, and oriental bittersweet uh, in, that, in that area as well. Um, just as a note while I'm thinking of it, we will be reviewing the wetland boundaries with a third party peer reviewer. There's a company called Ecotech that the commission has hired. Um, Art Allen is the soil scientist that will be reviewing the wetland boundary. He's been doing this longer than me and has reviewed uh, several of my lines over the years. So um, we're looking forward to working with Art to make sure that he agrees with, uh, with the line on the commission's behalf. The next slide, we sort of slide down to the buffer zones that are along the proposed retaining wall. These are the wetlands that border on Newton Pond. These buffer zones are even more so uh, altered with the internal access roadway and an artificial soil berm that sort of separates the activity associated with the facility and the wetlands. We saw that berm, we walked over it at the, at the site visit. That berm is functioning to limit um, turbid water that flows off of the site currently it's from getting into the wetlands. It sort of cr creates little ponding areas for stormwater to collect. Uh, we did see a fair amount of stormwater running off the site, turbid stormwater, and that's in large part because there's really no, not much stabilization on the site at all. Uh, the next slide. So this is sort of midway between areas where we are getting into those zones. This large green area is the 20,000 square foot buffer zone enhancement, I'm sorry, buffer zone restoration area that we're proposing. So basically what we're doing is we're taking these little isolated fragmented pockets of 30 and 15 foot buffer zone that are in rough shape. We're altering those to accommodate our development. And then we're proposing a singular 20,000 square foot wetland, or sorry, buffer zone restoration area. So we'll be grading that to be uh, relatively flat, uh, a slight slope descending toward the wetland. We have um, hundreds of native sapling trees and shrubs going in there. Um, we have native seed mixture going in there. We're making sure we have an adequate and natural soil profile with a good quality organic laden topsoil. Uh, we have an invasive species management plan that we're going to be implementing during the monitoring period. So it's, it's, um, it, it, it's quite intensive, the, the effort and design that went into how this is going to function to make sure that the function and value of that buffer zone um, is established and lasts in perpetuity. The next slide has another area where the retaining wall, you know, gets into the, um, gets into the buffer zone there. This slide also shows, it's hard to tell, but the, um, the green area, there's a hatched area to the right, probably in the right, there you go, thanks Haley. Um, that area in there, that, that is a buffer zone, a 9,000 square foot buffer zone enhancement area where we saw that area, it's sort of a meadow area. It had been previously disturbed. There's not a lot of woody vegetation in there. It has good ground cover establishment, but we're trying to sort of um, um, get going with a, a, wooded, a wooded area, give that area a head start by installing native trees and shrubs <clears throat> in that zone. Rich. Yes. Question, um, with the wall in the buffers, uh, buffer zone, how close is it to the 15 foot not dis not disturbed. Well, if you if you look at that plan there, for example, you can see there are um, there's the wetland line, which is the black line with the black triangles. Those are the represent the wetland flags. You have the uh, purple dashed or dotted line, rather. That's the 15 foot zone, and then the red dashed line is the 30 foot zone. So in that particular location, um, we're you know just getting inside the 30 foot. Uh, to the left, we're closer to the 15. You're close to the 15, but not in it. Um, you know. In this section. In this section, we're not. If, I think if you scroll back up, we might be able to see if there's any other sections. Yeah. In this yeah. Section. So it does cut to into the it. left. Yeah. So we're we're just inside of it there. So the, my question would be: Is there any way to shift the wall over so you're just out of that 15 foot no no build zone? I mean, we can look at that. I, I really don't think the placement of that wall is going to adversely affect the wetland based on the condition of that buffer zone now. I understand. Right. I completely understand what you're saying, but you know we do have a, a bylaw in town, yep. and we'd like to adhere to that as closely as we can. 
So if there's any places that you can do that, you know, it's not right. going to adversely affect you, I think it would be helpful. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, the next slide, one after that, the one after that, yeah. So that, that plan there, this is our, oh, not, not quite that one. This one? That, yeah, the one okay. to the top there, the landscape detail plan. So that, that plan is really the, the guidebook, if you will, for how to um, restore and enhance those buffer zone areas. On the left-hand side, we have some pretty thorough and concise details uh, with some general mitigation notes. Uh, we have the buffer zone restoration area. That's the 20,000 square foot restoration area. We have the 9,000 square foot enhancement area notes, and then we have the monitoring and invasive species management um, section to the bottom left. The center area of that plan specifies the native plants, quantities, and sizes that will be installed. And then the right-hand side has the seed mixtures and the um, tree and shrub specifications. The next slide gets into the site disturbance, which is a section of the report that we had submitted to the commission in response to your comments at the last hearing. One of the questions was, how much, will this, how much of this project will remain in open space? And the answer is about 60%. There's a 100.5 acre site, about 60 acres will be preserved as open space or maintained as open space as defined by the zoning board. Um, Alea had asked if there is any work extending into the uh, woodlands adjacent to the facility. Yes, there are. About 6.4 acres of woodlands in the adjacent to the facility will be altered, but of those 6.4 acres, about 1.8 acres are in the buffer zone. So about you know, under 2% of, uh, of the property is, is a wooded buffer zone that will be altered. From here, I'm going to turn it over to Doug from High Point, and uh, he's going to go over some of the, um, the drainage and the snow storage signage that we proposed, and then um, I think, and, and the phosphorus, of course, and then I think we'll wrap it up just sort of overviewing the waiver request. Thank you, Mitch. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, I was not here at the last hearing, but I did watch the, uh, the public access video, so able to get an understanding on the board's of the Commission's concerns. Regarding snow storage, uh, there was an item raised by staff regarding uh, embellishing the snow storage plan, but also making provisions for no, storage, no snow storage signage in order to better protect the front wetland, we'll call it, or the, you know, the west wetland. Uh, this plan, and you'll see in the next two slides, you'll see enlargements to make it a little easier to read. This is what we've done is we've taken the snow storage areas that we had shown on the individual plans that you first saw when you read the initial filing and put it into one comprehensive plan. This is both for the benefit of the commission as well as the planning board. And uh, so this plan shows in blue the designated snow storage areas. We've expanded it. But also in the upper right, uh, we have a project in, actually in Billerica that we recently had a similar request by the commission to provide no snow storage signage to protect the Concord River. So we thought that was a good uh, prototype in order to be able to demonstrate that the applicant is fully uh, committed to providing that snow storage signage in addition to a lot of the snow storage areas that we'll get into a little more detail. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the, the slides are broken basically front to back if you look at the development plan. So the snow the no snow storage signs are posted at the ends of the what we're referring to as the banked parking stalls that are graded and planted but not built as actually parking areas. And those signs are posted along the, um, the banked parking areas and then as you come out the driveway on the planned left side of the driveway, the no snow storage signs are also placed along that edge of the roadway. You'll see on this plan uh, the snow storage areas, as we decide, as we explained earlier about uh, the snow storage designation within the bank parking stalls. Is GFI has no intention to build those. It was more of a zoning compliance exercise, and so those, because those have been graded to be. Uh, 
in the event you had to build those, the, they were graded and the drainage system designed as, to accommodate them if they ultimately were paved. So for this plan, snow storage is proposed in those parking stall areas, as well as edge condition landscape areas throughout the site driveways, the center truck court island, and you'll see on plan right uh, a large blue area off the north side of building 200. This was a significant grassed area that is an excellent candidate for emergency snow storage of higher volumes. We've adjusted the site plan to create uh, gating in order for heavy equipment to be able to bring the snow into that zone and to stockpile it in that area. Next slide, please. And as we get toward the back of the property, we have snow storage areas. Again, we talked about the center island, the triangle area that's just on the opposite side of the wall from the restoration area that Rich was speaking to earlier. We've provoked the snow storage along the building side of the, of the drive, access driveways to ensure that no snow storage is going to get pushed over the wall. And then we've also designated snow storage areas at the ends of trailer storage locations. So the trailer storage areas are really a, is a managed area between the landlord and the tenant. And so oftentimes in these type of developments, we'll have snow, those are good candidates for snow storage areas. They're not typically fully utilized and are managed in a manner that allows for snow storage during the winter season. And all areas that we're proposing snow storage, all that runoff, when it melts, eventually drains to the stormwater management system for pretreatment prior to either recharge or surface discharge. Next slide, please. Uh, I also saw there were discussions regarding the phosphorus removal benefits of the project. And so I thought it would be helpful to revisit a slide that uh, we may have presented to the commission, but presented to the planning board that <coughs> depicts the stormwater best management practice areas that are uh, really critical to the phosphorus removal benefits of the project. Uh, you see the buildings in orange. In the green footprints, you see the retention infiltration areas. Uh, it'll be, I'll call it plan left, plan south, plan right, as well as subsurface infiltration areas within the center truck court and north of building 200. In addition to that, we have rain garden areas designated for the patios and pedestrian areas at the two building entries. For phosphorus removal, uh, first of all, let's talk about what phosphorus is and why we're doing what we're doing. Phosphorus is a natural element. Uh, phosphorus accumulates in, uh, on surfaces and then is washed off when, when you have rainfall events. You have higher phosphorus loadings in areas where there might be uh, landscaping or fertilization or thing, items like that, hard surfaces such as just pavements and sidewalks, and also roofs. You know, they, and the, um, the MS4 guidelines and the EPA guidelines for establishing phosphorus loading by land use are identified in a manner that you take basically the acreage of your <coughs> land use and you apply a loading, phosphorus loading per acre of land of that use. And it's essentially, it's a, an accounting. How much phosphorus would this particular development generate? And you come up with a number. So that's how we generally deal with the phosphorus on this. The reason we talk about the best management practices is infiltration, significant infiltration, which in this case we're infiltrating north of an inch of, rain, of runoff before we have any direct runoff outside of the infiltration basins. Uh, is really the most efficient means by which you remove phosphorus from stormwater. Additionally, you have rain gardens. Those are also efficient in phosphorus uptake because of the plants that have nutrient uptake um, and pull the phosphorus in order to be able to promote their own growth and viability. So as we look at this project as it relates to Newton Pond, we can go to the next slide to describe how this relates to Newton Pond. So we know that Newton Pond has a, a total maximum daily load designation. There was a study done in 2020 entitled The Total Maximum Daily Loads of Phosphorus for Selected North, Northern Blackstone Lakes. Uh, this was initiated, I believe, by DEP 
And it, what they, when you look at the study, the report designates a recommended phosphorus loading based upon the general land uses within that watershed. So it gives you, for this particular, this project, it recommends a maximum daily load of 23 kilograms per year for phosphorus loading for a commercial industrial development. For residential developments, it's higher because of the, uh, the intended uh, need to be able to have people, want, people want to have lawns, so there's additional fertilizer applications and so forth. Um, open space areas have their own separate numbers. So what we do is we take the loading of the project, the phosphorus loading, before you put in the best management practice mitigation from the stormwater. We have the target for the Newton Pond watershed for com industrial commercial properties, which is 23 kilograms per year. And then you, you take the credits for the phosphorus reduction by routing the runoff through the infiltration basins, the inf subsurface infiltration chambers, and the rain gardens. And what you ultimately result in is that by virtue of this project, we have a significant reduction in phosphorus loading by virtue of the mitigation through the BMPs down to 6.4 kilograms per year, which is what would be the discharge from the project site. So the target's 23 maximum per the report. The project only discharges 6.4. So it's really 72% less than what the recommended total maximum daily load is. And, and right now, in the current condition, there is none, none of this. There's none of this. There's zero. So it's That's correct. maximum is, is being discharged. It, I can't say for sure that the current site activities creates, it. creates a certain number. We haven't done that analysis. However, barren land like this, you have much more uh, immediate runoff that contributes to the phosphorus loading of the pond than you would in our project because you're actually collecting and conveying the runoff directly to the infiltration basins. Correct. So uh, in summary, that, um, that's the phosphorus benefit for the project. It, it significantly benefits at least what this project site's um, contributions are within the larger Newton Pond watershed. Uh, and also, as a last item, and the project team was discussing this in the last um, paragraph, that the applicant is, is open to a special condition about limiting the use of phosphorus-containing fertilizers uh, within the landscape areas. I'll note that the significant portion of the landscape that we're proposing on the site will not be fertilized. It's the conservation mixes for, for wet sites for the stormwater basins. It's the erosion control mix for the side slopes. It's only would be in the areas where you have immediately near the building storefronts uh, where they would want to have some uh, a little better aesthetic, if you will, for your front address. But in the end, again, the applicant is, um, is open to restricting that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I probably would turn it over to Rich at this point. Yeah, thanks, Doug. I just wanted to recall the um, areas. This is the representative photographs that we included in the notice of intent. Um, we understand that this is the first, if not one of the first projects where a waiver request is being asked of the commission. And we really tried to set the bar high because we know in all likelihood the commission's concerned about precedent and other developers coming along and saying, well, you, you let the applicant, you let GFI do it, so why not let me do it? But um, I think this site really affords a, a very unique opportunity. Number one, because of the previously developed and degraded nature of the site and the buffer zones that we're trying to alter in large part. Um, the significant three and a half to one, which is much larger than your two to one, you know, buffer zone restoration and enhancement that we're proposing. And I think those areas being continuous with the larger Newton Pond watershed area, the Newton Pond uh, wetland and buffer zone system, that's going to contribute much more significantly to uh, pollution, pre pre pollution prevention, uh, wildlife habitat, 
erosion and sediment control, you know, all of those interests that the bylaw and the state law protect compared to what's there now. I mean, the, the stormwater management alone for this project, even if we were to not include any buffer zone enhancement, is a massive improvement compared to what's out there now because there is nothing now. There's no vegetation to, to uptake some of these nutrients and stabilize the soil and everything else. So I just wanted to sort of reiterate that point. Um, the bottom right is actually a photograph of the enhancement area that we're going to be um, planting. But um, I wanted to just sort of reiterate that point in the context of the waiver request that we're, that we're asking of you. Uh, so I think that's it. I think we'll turn it over to the commission for any questions or further discussion. Okay. Diane? Uh, yeah, I do. I do have a question. Um, so, um, uh, DEP made some comments uh, that I, I just want to ask you about, okay? Uh, the first is about the potential for adverse impacts uh, to the resource area from work in the buffer zone that it may increase with the extent of the work and the proximity to the resource area. In other words, if, if this is the buffer zone and your work is pressing down through it below there, the closer you get to the resource area, the more the resource area is at risk, right? um, which is just, you know, logic. Mm -hmm. It's also probably mathematical. I mean, I'll bet you could make an alg algorithm about that one, right? Uh, but the other one is about steep slopes, slopes, as usual. And this is a very sloped site. And I know that the, the buildings themselves are going to be lifted, I can't remember how much it is, 15 or 20 feet or something like that at the, at the bottom of that slope. It's pretty steep. So the more there is a steep slope, that increases the potential for adverse impacts on the resource area. So when you combine these two things of of going into the buffer zone and having the slope, then you've <coughs> got some sort of uh, mathematical increase in the risk of adverse effects on Newton Pond. And that is, after all, the Newton Pond empties directly into Lake Quinsigamon. And all of the ground there is an aquifer. Mm -hmm. It's just <laughs> straight down. Uh, so, you know, you could imagine in a war zone that they would be figuring out, well, what could these adverse things be? We don't know what they're going to be. It could be like a Hurricane Katrina event, right? Maybe the hurricane doesn't really hit as hard here, but the rain hits here, mm -hmm. right? Or it could be a spill, like a spill that combines with a rain event or something like that. So my question is, since, um, and there's not much that can be done about a steep slope. It is what it is. It goes down to the pond. But um, building into the buffer zone, is there a way around that? So that's a good question, and I appreciate those points that DEP has brought up, and we're going to be preparing a written response that the commission can digest. But, at, you know, first, my, my initial response, if you will, is we're already seeing that at that site now. Right now, we have alteration very close to the wetland. Yeah. We have steep slopes descending toward the wetland. When we were walking along that steep slope, uh, along the eastern edge of the development where you guys went down into the, uh, the low-lying area where the wetlands were, we saw erosion coming off of that slope in areas where the slope was not stabilized. Our project does not propose steep slopes in that area. We are using a retaining wall to limit the use and effectively eliminate any steep slopes. So the retaining wall is going to provide a physical barrier that's going to separate the development from the buffer zone restoration and enhancement areas and the other buffer zone and wetland areas that will remain. It's hard to argue with a retaining wall. It's, it's there. It's a physical um, structure. It's a, uh, it's a barrier and a boundary that clearly defines the work area from the natural area. So 
so we're not going to have much potential for erosion and sedimentation as you would with a steep slope. Um, we're not going to have a hard time maintaining vegetative cover as you would often on a steep slope. So by way of employing that retaining wall, we're effectively eliminating, el limiting our work area, eliminating the steep slopes. And that gives us all that room to propose that buffer zone restoration and enhancement that we do. Um, so that, that's kind of my initial, my initial thought. You know, we, we have alteration very close to the wetlands now. Um, we're not making it worse. I think we're making it a lot better with this project. And it, it is a win-win, I think, for the applicant and the commission because the applicant is proposing responsible development with the warehouses and the, the parking areas and the landscaping and the um, stormwater management, but the commission is getting significant improvements to the protection of that resource, especially compared to what's here. Now, if, if, if this lot was a wooded lot, I probably wouldn't be up here saying that. Um, but because of the deg degraded nature of the site that's out there now, it's, it can only get better with this development. It is a very degraded site. It's horrific. Um, I don't know about everyone else who was on the, the site visit, but I was depressed when I left. Mm -hmm. it's, it's grotesque. But my question still remains, does the warehouse that for me is on the left-hand side, I guess that's the south, um, does it have to be that close to the upper zone. Well, the warehouse um, is actually outside of the buffer zone, I believe. Uh, yeah. Maybe a little little bits of it are in, in the outer part there. Um, but the um, you know it, there's not a moratorium on work in the buffer zone, obviously, and it, the onus is on us to demonstrate that the work in the buffer zone is not going to have an adverse impact to the wetland. Again, I would suggest, and we'll get into this in more detail in our response to DEP's comments, but you have such an altered and degraded situation now that by stabilizing and establishing this development within the buffer zone, you're, you're going to stabilize the land. It's no longer going to be prone to erosion and sedimentation, uh, turbid stormwater runoff. Um, you know, the equipment going back and forth with the, uh, with the continued moving of the aggregate across the site. Um, it will be stabilized. The resource areas adjacent to it will be protected with that retaining wall, the physical barrier. There won't be any future encroachment into the area. Um, you know, perhaps we could look at some sort of a deed restriction or something like that for that portion of the site. Um, but I, I really don't think in this case, in this particular case, work this close to the wetland is going to adversely affect the wetland, given what's already out here, given the restorative efforts that we're proposing to improve the protection of the wetland. I just, I have one question about the emergency snow storage area. Um, you indicated that for the snow storage that all the, the melt would be intercepted and be able to be treated. What about for the emergency st snow storage area, which was going, I think, to be on grassland? Correct. And uh, that area has actually an area drain in it that ties to the drainage system. So, there's it, so that snow melt would, over time, migrate into the surface drain, and that is treated downstream by the stormwater management system. Okay. It's one of the reasons we put, placed it there, knowing that downstream it's getting pretreatment before it goes to infiltration or to surface discharge. Okay, thank you. Chris? No additional questions. Um, the only thing I, I would like you to look at hard is if you can move any permanent structure out of that 30 foot. No. Out of the, out of the 15 foot? The 15 foot's a no disturb zone. Right. The 30 foot is a no permanent structure. All right, well. I, I would like we, you to take a look at that and see if you can do that because, you know, we do have a bylaw that we worked a long time on getting it implemented. And, and this project started in 2019 and, and was effectively designed 
before your bylaw was put into place. We knew that we that this site was ripe for restoration and enhancement within those buffer zone areas. And it was always my intention, being part of the project team since 2019, to advocate for that. And I've been advocating for that all along. It wasn't until this bylaw was passed, however, that we really started digging in and preparing the notice of intent application. Uh, we knew that there was a waiver provision in the bylaw that allows for unique situations. Uh, we talk in the notice of intent about how this project fits into that unique situation and how it uh, is a, the, the waiver request provision applies to this project. Obviously, there's no mandate that the commission shall issue a waiver request in any situation. Um, but in, in this situation, I think we've demonstrated that this project with the buffer zone enhancement and restoration will better protect the wetlands and buffer zones than this project without the restoration and enhancement. And the, the massing, the, the scale of the project, the requirements that planning and zoning have, uh, the turn radi radius of the access roads and the entryways and sight lines and distance from intersections. You know, there's a lot of competing influences that went into what this development looks like. And it's for those reasons that, uh, of course, if it was an easy fix, we would have done it <laughs> to get out of the 15 and 30. So we're really trying to offset those, you know, minor impacts, fragmented impacts here and there for the site by proposing, you know, three and a half to one, which is more than the commission's two to one, and really set the bar high for um, future folks that might want to come in and, and also ask you for a waiver. Uh, Andy? I know for the questions. Oh, yeah? Um, the, a lot of the snow storage locations are a, a kind of put into landscaping areas. Are those um, salt tolerant species being used? Uh, we'll verify that on the planting plan. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, sorry, I wrote really tiny and I can't read my notes anymore. Um, I know you said the, uh, obviously these are out generally outside of uh, the buffer areas, but I just wanted to know if the, the landscaping that kind of is at the front of the building is all native species as well is do you know if the all of the species to be planted all of the landscaping to be done will be native species or are we gonna I don't think I don't determine yeah, yeah the um, the planning plan was more generic in nature it didn't drill down to specific species but okay. um, could there we be can propose any? a palette and yeah. Say, could these would be a yeah. I don't. I don't necessarily need to know. You know. Yeah. This specific native species going here, but it would be great to have um, just a, a lean towards native species. So we're yes. not. And that's not on putting invasives back <laughs> where oh, we're yeah, removing no, the invasives. Of course, there wouldn't be any, <laughs> would be any invasives. Yeah. You know, we can't promise there won't be some hydrangeas or flowering dogwoods. You know, things like some of those are native, but okay. Um, we, we, yeah, we can take a look at that and see if we can't come up with something that... Yeah. Yeah, because it would add to the restoration area of the site if, if there were more native species going in throughout the... Mm -hmm. And there are some very beautiful natives available. Sure. In place of hydrangeas and dogwoods. Um, I, kn I know we have, we have talked about this a lot. Um, about scaling back this is it does seem to be the larger of the two buildings though where we are cutting into that or you know the the building is bigger so the the drive is bigger so the retaining wall is pushed out a little bit more they all kind of feed into each other um, if you know you got a lot of square footage there is there any way to pull it back so then you can pull back the roadway so you can pull back the retaining wall even just out of the 15 foot buffer um, you could also restore that area if you were feeling crazy, but take a look. that additional little smidge of yeah, we'll, triangle. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. I mean, it's, um, yeah. Yeah, it would, you know, it would be a small area, but just that, you know, one little corner pulling out would be, would be so cool. I think that's it for me. So I think what you're hearing from the commission is if you can, whatever you can do to pull something back would help us 
you know, and looking at other things. And we do realize you're doing a lot of enhancement, and we do realize that, you know, with all your stormwater management, it's going to reduce a lot of the flow that's going into the wetlands now. So, mm -hmm. you know, we understand that, too. But whatever you can do to get that out of those buffers would, would be appreciated. Understood. All right, so I guess if you guys are all set, we're going to open up for questions. Any, anybody in the audience have any questions? Yes, sir, please come up to the podium. And just, just to say, keep it to the wetlands and um, what, what, how it relates to what this meeting is about, okay? Sure. My name's Andy Barnes, 115 Clinton Street. Uh, I would like to say that it's very difficult to constantly have to go like, now we're only talking about sound or now we're only talking about traffic or now we're only talking about the wetlands. Well, that's what this is the Especially, conservation commission and this is what sure, we're totally. here to hear you talk about yeah totally okay. it's but i think we could all agree that things like sound and light pollution and traffic absolutely affect the wetlands because the wetlands are um more than just the water and the runoff and the phosphorus it's also all of the animals that live around there the insects everything it's all an ecosystem sound light traffic all of that will affect it so i'm just saying outside of that it's very difficult to just talk about one thing i would like to in 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 just staying on this one topic i would like a little bit of clarification though um i was under the impression that uh there was a request to turn this uh zoning to light industrial in the 2020 not not part of this commission don't know I believe it was 2020 right Oh, please, please. And it was uh, for a research facility. Sir. But they've had sir, plans sir. since 2019. You're, got, you're getting off topic. Okay. Please, please keep it. I'm just confused about this, what the What this are. board has to do. If you don't Absolutely, have any questions about the wetlands, you can go sit down. I will, I will leave. I will end with this. Um, we spoke for 25 minutes about um, how a single car garage was not necessary. And I think that. You're, I think I understand it's a different bylaw. I get that. And it was a different situation. It's a grandfathered thing. And it seems like you guys are starting to come around to this. But I would like to um, really, really make sure that there's no reason that this almost million square foot facility can't get a little bit smaller so that they do not go at all over the buffer zone crazy that we would go at all over the buffer zone for over 920,000 square feet and then to say that we're planting some plants and we're going to change a little bit of runoff is actually going to make things better by paving 920,000 square feet sounds crazy to me and I mean like you know I don't, I don't have a degree in uh, conservation or whatever so I don't know I, I can't I can't talk to that, but um, it's, uh, I, I just hope you don't let them go over the buffer zone. So it seems like it's one thing that we can say is make your already insanely large building who we don't even have customers for yet a little bit smaller. Thanks. Anybody else have any questions, concerns, ma'am? Hi there, uh, Rachel Missile, 23 Cypress. Thank you very much for your time tonight and thank you for the podium, it really helps. A um, few things, I'm gonna try and go quickly. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for exceeding the 2023 stretch code and um, on this project and planning to include a lot of native plantings, I think that's really important. Um, I wanted to know about stormwater treatment around the area will that filter out salt salt is soluble in water mm -hmm. uh, so to the extent that the stormwater management system can uh, remove it it will but you don't put take salt out of suspension obviously okay um, but so. the way dep uh, designs the standards by which we're required to comply with the assumption is that they understand that there'll be some salt laden runoff at times. But I will point out to you that in the operation and maintenance plan, we are proposing non-salt de-icing 
materials on the property. So your concern about salt being in the runoff and into the ground yeah. really should not be a major concern of yours or the, the commissions because of the, the restrictions we place upon ourselves in the operation and maintenance plan. And will you be m retaining ownership of this property in perpetuity? I can answer that question. So um, the operation and management plan is a requirement of whoever owns the property. Um, so I- Forever? Yes. Okay. For this project. Mm -hmm. So anybody who purchases this project, this building, these buildings later will have to adhere to the requirement that no salt be used on that property. Okay, yeah. that's fantastic yes. to know. Yeah. Um, So this does help mitigate the um, effect on the wetlands from the project site itself. However, what we're looking at is an increase from 344 vehicle trips per day to 2,132, if I read the DEIR correctly. So. That's going to take care of the site itself. However, all of the roads around it, which are definitely currently treated, but are going to see a lot more activity, are not going to be. <laughs> um, that also means that there's going to be a lot of other pollutants from vehicles on the roads, which are going to run off into our aquifer, into the wetlands. So that's something I think we need to take into consideration. This is a massive increase in activity in 73 foot trucks if I remember correctly um, this is a huge impact it should not be taken lightly and in the grand scheme of what we're looking at with respect to um, maintaining and preserving our wetlands I think you guys really need to look at this very closely um, I also wanted to point out that wetlands replication is not known to be a very successful strategy and it seems to be something I'm hearing over and over again with different projects and again it's something I don't think that the Commission should be allowing I'm, uh, she, um, then you're not filling any wetlands we're, right we're not filling any wetlands so we're not proposing any wetland replication what we're proposing okay. is to restore the buffer zone buffer. my apologies I misunderstood that um, the other thing that I wanted to address is um, that we keep being told at various, uh, with various projects, that anyone who pollutes our water supply is going to be responsible for cleaning it up. And that's too late. I'm sorry, but we've already had chromium-6 in our water, and we've already got PFAS in our water, and endangering our um, aquifer is a really bad idea and I don't see this project being the right thing to be putting over our aquifer. The other thing I'll say and I'll echo other people's comments, this project is too big. There is absolutely no reason it has to be this size. There is no reason that a waiver should be granted to this project and there is absolutely no reason that it has to encroach on the 15 and 30 foot zones. Thank you so much for your time. Is there anybody else that has any questions? Hi, Tom Grisso uh, for Candlewood Way. I've heard a lot about plants tonight. You are concerned, the Conservation Commission is concerned about animals, right? Uh, yes? Yes. Okay. So my question is an animal question, and I didn't want to ask it if I was off, off target. Um, there's a lot of animals around that you may have seen around uh, Newton Pond. There's turkeys. There's lots of turkeys and geese, swans, herons sometimes, lots of fish, of course. And I haven't heard anything yet about the potential effects of the uh, diesel exhaust from 550 trailer tractors a day 
on wildlife in the area. I'm wondering if that's being looked at, if it's being tested, if there's any science on it. Um, we'd like to know about it. Thank you. Any other questions? Gretchen Nolan, 20 Bosworth Road. With the subject of animals coming up, the other night I was jotting down all the animals in our neighborhood. Would you like to have a copy of just what I, top of the head animals? Sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Hi there, good evening. Uh, Krista Dupre, my apologies, a little bit allergy season got me today. Um, just real quick, in regards to the um, Phosphorus, you mentioned the fertilizer, correct? Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, my understanding from, and I understand, I'm only bringing this up because they had mentioned it earlier. My understanding in the aquifer overlay district, non residential application of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizer are prohibited uses. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be followed? Yes. Okay. In addition, I know they touched on the road salt as well and the other de-icing chemicals that are prohibit prohibited within um, the area. The other question, uh, or ask, I should say, um, to help me understand, do you have a rendering, like, standing to see? I know you talked about there's not the elevation, but I think it would be really helpful to see the rendering of the retaining walls. I know we're looking at an aerial view, but is there a different view we can see that I don't know if it's handy on the computer? Just to understand, it might give me a better perspective of where we are talking, especially with these boundary lines, because I do feel there should not be a waiver granted as well. Um, every inch seems to be impacted in this, and coming and having that waiver um, seems to be uh, way too way too close um, that was my other ask I, in addition to how are if there was accident fire what type of resources does our fire department have or would be on site for like a truck fire those types of things and I think of different chemicals and things that would come off um, and then potentially go into the groundwater thank you Okay, any other questions? Sure. I'm so sorry, there was one other thing I meant to touch on, Rachel, Rachel. Missile 23 Cyprus. Um, one thing I did note was that um, there is a rare species on the property called the orange sallow moth, and according to the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, light pollution is a threat to that species and it also requires false foxglove to lay its eggs. So I was wondering um, what's being done to address that species. And also I just wanted to note that wildlife m migration patterns will also likely be affected by 24-7 operations, light, trucks, human activity there all the time. Um, again, part of the whole ecosystem, this is gonna affect wetland um, wildlife as well. So I don't know if you guys have any specific answers with respect to that moth or not. If I could through the chair. Yeah, Rich. So this property is not mapped by the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program as estimated habitat for rare wildlife or priority habitat for rare plants. There is another property, you may have read this, the, the 
you may have read this in, the, uh, in one of the MEPA documents. There is another property um, on the other side of um, Clinton Street, uh, off of Holden Street, that was originally combined with this development that GFI owns. And there is orange Salamoth habitat on that property. And we were working with Natural Heritage to discuss what sort of habitat exists and what could be done to mitigate and what areas to stay away from, et cetera. But this project has certainly no rare habitat on it. If, you know, obviously if um, sand and gravel operations provided rare habitat, we'd, we'd, it'd be great, I suppose, or we'd be in trouble, one or the other. But, um, you know, that, that habitat does not exist on that site. It's not mapped and um, it's just not there. So I think you might be okay. getting confused with the other proper property off of Holden Street where I it probably does exist. Did. Yeah, and my apologies for that. I, it's a lot of this is, is difficult for those of us who it's are not lot. in the yep. industry to, yep. to um, figure out. But my point still stands, 24-7 operation of uh, light and vehicles is definitely going to um, disrupt wildlife that is dependent on wetlands specific to this commission, but the overall habitat as well. Um, and I would ask if there's any possibility that you would consider limiting the hours of operation of these warehouses so that there is no 24-7 operation permitted, because I think that would do a lot to um, I think that's a allay plan. some of I think the that's concerns. that's a planning board question. It is, but it's not, because, mm, that, it, it because it affects the wetland species, that does fall under your purview, and it should be considered mm. in the grand scheme. I think, you know, limiting things, uh, one of the gentlemen was talking about the pi bigger picture, and you have to consider the bigger picture here. I know that you have your limitations legally, but I think you also have to take these things into consideration, and it's not just deer, and it's not just turkeys. These are wetland species as well that need to have dark. And so I think that's a fair question to ask. I'll Thank let you, you guys think about it. Okay. Um, I don't see any more hands up, so I guess we're going to continue this meeting. To, uh, uh, yes, May 14th it May, is. May yes. 14th, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We don't. No. Isn't Cherry Street? Where did it go? Oh. Okay, we're just. I don't know if they're rejecting me. There you go. Okay. Oh. Well, that was unnecessary. Let's see. Where are we going? Amen. Oh, Alea, is there anybody here from the Cherry Street? They didn't say they wouldn't be here. So I'll just read it. Um, they we. We can talk about them, I guess, without them, because there are updates. But I don't know. So yeah, I would. Yeah, give, give, it, a, give it a good if old. They're not here. I'd re just assume have them give us the updates and. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. But I'll, I'll we'll read it. Uh, we have a continued public hearing regarding the abbreviated notice of resource area delineation filed by Dave Calhoun, Saxton Partners. 25 Recreational Park Drive, Suite 204, Hingham Mass, for the delineation of a perennial river and inland bank, an intermittent stream at 2834 Cherry Street, 45, and 47 63 Memorial Drive. Is there anybody here re representing this? Okay, we'll keep this continued to our next meeting, uh, May 14th. I did want to note prior to that, they have. Um, Peer review has been sent out for them, so they should be starting their peer review um, as soon as I get money for it. Okay. And then Art will be on his merry way. Okay. Thank you. All right. We have a new public hearing. <coughs> Notice is hereby given in accordance with the provisions of General Laws, Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Town of Shrewsbury 
Wetlands Bylaw and Regulations that Paul Valenti, 7 Temple Court, Shrewsbury, has filed a notice of intent for the demolition and reconstruction of a single family home and associated site work at 7 Temple Court. Uh, thank you for the record, John Grenier. J.M. Gurney Associates. I'm also here with Paul Valenti, who is the owner and applicant uh, for this redevelopment. This lot is um, off of North Street. Um, you go from now on to Lear Street and then the Temple Court. There's a dead end road that ends right at uh, all the property. This is an existing undersized lot. It's uh, just about 10,900 square feet. There is an existing house on the property. There's a driveway that extends up the end of Temple Court, and there is another small shed in the northeast corner. Um, the property and the house is, uh, the house is pretty much ready to get demoed. Um, he actually did propose a demolition per permit for it. Um, when he went to take the asbestos out and everything, the house is, is falling in on itself. Um, so Paul's in the process of having the house demolished. Um, as part of this process too, um, Paul did file with the zoning board. Um, the location of the existing house is non-conforming um, for our setbacks. He got a special permit from the zoning board to pull the new house further away from the lake and um, still in non-conformity with the side yard setback, but to pull it away from the lake and have it more centered on the lot. So what he is proposing is to build a, a split level plant house um, on the lot. As you see, on the, in the existing condition, I believe it was oh, 17, it was 18 feet off the lake in this location. Um, the existing shed is 16 feet off the lake over on the eastern side. And also the existing driveway, which comes in, comes in off of Temple Court, that is, uh, the edge of that is within 10 feet of, of the lake over on that eastern side. So for the redevelopment, um, while pulling the house, Further away from the lake, you can see this corner skirts right up at the 30-foot um, wetland setback. The, there are a couple other corners that are within the setback. We tried to angle it so that we were keeping the, the most distance we could away from the lake. Um, the closest point, there is a deck located right here, just 20 feet off of the lake, uh, just with the deck in that corner. The shed is getting removed. We're pulling the driveway outside of the 15-foot buffer to the lake, and we're also going to capture all of the runoff. We pitched everything, so we're capturing all of the runoff from the, the driveway into an infiltration trench that will be along the shoulder of the driveway. Um, also, we're capturing all of the roof runoff and recharging that into the ground. So um, it's an undersized lot. Um, again, we went to the zoning board to pull it as far away from the lake as we can. Uh, it's, it's just a split-level ranch house that Paul is, is building for himself so he can um, retire quietly on, on the lake. Um, and we're doing everything we can to meet all of stormwater management for capturing the driveway runoff. Right now, everything just sheet flows off into the lake, so we're capturing that um, and recharging that, also capturing the roof runoff, recharging that. So. Um, we're taking what's kind of a small lake lot and uh, really doing everything we can to improve the, the, the ability for it to function and treat storm water and take what's kind of a tough lot right now and make some improvements to it and give a pulp a nice place to settle on the, on the lake. Um, so that's 
that's the long and short of it. Um, if you have any questions or comments, we'd like to try to address them. Diane? Um, yeah. Um, it is an improvement over the, the house that's coming down. Um, if it were rotated, wouldn't it be less over that 30 foot wetland buffer? Is rotating it clockwise? No, counterclockwise. But then the, the issue you have is then you're, you're coming up this big port and you're trying to turn to get into the garage. And if you were to back out of the garage or back out of the driveway, you wouldn't have the ability to maneuver without taking the driveway and putting that closer to, to the water. You know what I mean? Okay, so that, so that orientation is because of the oh, driveway. Yeah, so he can get in and get out and not have to do maneuvering, which would then make him put the pavement even closer to the lake. So we want to try to keep that pavement outside that 15 foot and then also be able to capture it and, and treat it and recharge it. That's really where you're going to get most of your, your sands, your pollutants that would go into the lake. So we can try to, the roof runoff is, is clean. We can capture that, put that to the ground. The, the sheet flow off the driveway, we're trying to capture that. So that's why we kitty cornered it, just so it wasn't awkward to pull in there. If you pull in and have to take a hard 90 degree turn to maneuver and get out, can't do it without, getting, without going closer to the, to the lake on that eastern side. Okay, thank you. Martha? Is the driveway, sorry, is the garage under the house? It's a split, so yeah. The okay, okay. And um, are you, when you leave the garage, are you going to have to back out of Temple or do you have room to turn around? It's it's a it's a wide one car garage, so if you if he's parking on the the left side of it, he should have to be able to to maneuver to do a a, a three point turn, but it's tight for sure. If that, I mean, I think you should probably realistically think about that, and if that seems too difficult, you should think about revising the plan to to show that. Well, I, I mean, I, okay. Yeah. Understood. That's it. Chris? The stairs that are <coughs> touching the lake, those are the existing stairs. You're not putting new stairs in. Not touching That's existing stairs. wooden stairs. Okay. They're, they're kind of beat up, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, they're so beat up. He might fix them, but he's, those are existing steps. Okay. That? Yeah. So, with your orientation of the house in, in the 30 foot buffer, are you requesting a waiver? Yes, please. And, and with the understanding that we went to the zoning board to pull um, the house further away from the lake and further than it is from the lake right now. And, and the configuration of the lot is such that there's, you're surrounded by water on all sides? Yeah. Three. The only, yeah, there's one, there's one abutter to the what, south, mm -hmm. west, um, number five, Temple Court. But other than that, he's, he's surrounded by water on three sides. So did you, did, um, you? okay, um, Andy, do you have any questions? Um, well, just a kind of vacation, so you own one temple court too, so? Yes. So which, are you going to live in both of them, or just? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't. Because you've already got a house on the lake, so. Couldn't afford it. All right. Aaliyah? Um, this is a pretty well-treed lot currently. Uh, is there a proposal to remove all of these trees to, to, in order to do this construction um, and demolition? There's two... Um, <coughs> Good-sized trees on the lot. Um, there's a 36-inch oak right here, and there's another 36-inch maple. The intent is to oak um, by mislocation. It could end up, and it's not necessarily in the greatest shape. It could end up disturbing some of the, the roots. 
or so. The intent is to remove that 36 inch oak, and where the 36 inch maple is kind of off to the, to the edge beyond where they would be doing some of the recharge chambers, um, we wouldn't be disturbing the root structure on that. So the intent is to keep the 36 inch maple. Um, but that oak tree's that oak tree's got to go. Okay, and then there are several smaller trees. What about those? Yeah, um, those were the two significant trees on the site. But so everything else between demolishing the house, getting you know, in getting equipment to, in there. In order to get the grades that we need, they have to come down. Again, yeah, pretty much. So is there? That's going to become lawn. It looks pretty well, like forested area right now. That's it's. Obviously, I have an old photo, so I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but it doesn't look like it's a, a big lawn. My concern is that it's going to become big lawn. The, where the erosion control is placed, he's not going to disturb anything um, you know, along the shoreline. But that's, the sh that's the shoreline, though. Correct. That's not 15 foot of no disturb area. That's grass to shore. But you click on the whole site. Yeah. yeah, a lot of it's with the exception of I, I mean, he's going to try to save the mature trees, but a lot of it's that one of the mature trees. The yeah. other one is chopping down a lot bigger of it's tree. It's a lot of it's scrubbier material, and in order to get in there, tear a house down, and build a new one, you know, he has to be able to get around, get around a lot to to work. You can't. You have to be careful now because you're working under the bylaw, so you have a 15 foot. No yeah. disturb zone, and then you're encroaching. You're in the 30 foot no build zone. So, did you give us in writing what your request would be for the waiver? We did not. We can give. So, that can to you end. come back? Can you look at two things? Can you look at trying to rotate the house? Yeah. And can you look and give us the reason your request? Sure. For the waiver, and in the waiver state, how much? How many square feet is in the 30 foot okay. no build zone? Okay. And on top of that, we'll go out, I'll go out with Paul and we'll take a look at some of the vegetation out there and see what, if there's additional, we looked at some, obviously the big trees, but if there's other vegetation that we can, you know, knowing that he has to tear the house down, he has to get in there, and, and if what we realistically can, can save and maintain and maybe do some additional planting. Correct, and then if there's something that's pre-existing Note that so you can um, re note that on, in your request if there's okay. pre existing stairs that's going to stay, or if there's a, like you said, the shed, if there's something in that 15 foot no disturb, just note it They'll okay. put it on the plan. Okay. All right, we'll give you quite a bit more detail on that. Okay. And so it looks like there's a, um, there is an existing driveway kind of in the area that. Is, are you just going to re-asphalt that, or is it getting longer or bigger or something? The, there's an existing driveway <coughs> that is <coughs> beautiful. The existing driveway skirts closer to the lake over on this side, and then there's a retaining wall on either side, and then you can pull in. There's a, there's a small garage right there. Um, it's kind of hard to see because it's... Oh. This looks like the... Yeah, I'll show you. If you, if you look... Yeah. <laughs> well, we can... You're on the wrong side. Right. right here. Okay. That's a retaining wall. There's a garage underneath. And so this is the driveway. You can see in this area, it's a little grayer. That's where the driveway kind of flares out closer to the lake. And then you can pull in. There's a, a, a garage right there. And there's retaining walls on either side of it. So that's the configuration now. Um, so the reconfiguration is to um, pull the edge of the driveway further away from the lake so that we can, one, keep it out of the 15 foot, and two, capture it, and you can try to treat that runoff um, you know, before it just sheet. So it sheet flows into the lake right now. So we're going to try to capture that and treat it. But I'll give you much more detail on what the for the waiver what we're disturbing what we're not disturbing what we can save and what's existing within the buffer zone so we can give you a full analysis of what's there and what's we're proposing all right 
I, yes, Martha? Are you de I'm, I'm looking at the numbers on the two different plans. Are you decreasing the footprint by seven feet? Is it when F you say footprint, square footage, or? I guess it's square footage. I'm not quite sure what I think that's the elevation. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, ele the elevation? Oh, that's elevation. Okay. Never mind. So, but yeah, that is a, um, are, are you increasing or decreasing the square footage of the general um, box shape? The, the footprint. The footprint's a little bigger. The footprint's a little bigger, for sure. Um, I don't know what the exact square footage is, but when we get into that analysis, we'll give you the, we'll give you the, the numbers on everything. Do you have yeah, a I'd water like service for this, too? Is it yeah. fed by water? Yeah. Water, uh, water service, he's got sewer. The sewer's shown, but the water service isn't. Yeah, it's is on there. It's on there? Yeah. Comes oh, I that. see it. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, um, and we're going to want some mitigation, because obviously. Well, that's what I'm saying. If come, it's come. quite intrusive into the buffers. So. No, no touch. So come come back and tell us how much you're disturbing. And then what, what you're, how you're going to mitigate it. And we strongly suggest you stay out of those buffers as much as you can so okay. you can make the house smaller or rotate it okay. to get out. And we do understand you have water on all sides, so you're, you're kind, of, yeah. kind of limited, so. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Public hearing. Thank you. Notice is hereby given in accordance with the provisions of General Laws, Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Town of Shrewsbury Wetlands Bylaw and Regulations, that Julianne Hertill, 54 Lakeside Drive, Shrewsbury, has filed a notice of intent for the construction of a patio, deck, staircase, and fence, as well as the removal of two trees at 54 Lakeside Drive. Good evening, I'm Kate O'Donnell from Ecotech, uh, wetland scientist. I'm here with Julianne Hertel, the applicant and property owner. Uh, I was on the site in August of last year to delineate the wetland resource areas, which consists of the bank of Flint Pond. The site is about a little less than a half acre, um, and it's developed with an existing single family house with an existing paved driveway, garage, deck, lawn and landscaped areas. The applicant is proposing a few um, improvements to her property, including a fence around uh, an existing lawn area that's located greater than 50 feet from, sorry, greater than 30 feet from um, Flint Pond. And then additionally, a small patio, uh, also within existing lawn, um, also outside of the 30 foot no structure zone. Um, also proposed is a deck expansion. So there is an existing deck at the property <coughs> um, and the applicant would like to uh, extend a small portion of it to match the extent of the, um, of the existing deck and then extend it a little bit on the other side. So a portion of that is outside the 30 foot no structure, but a portion of it is within the, the 30 foot no structure zone mm -hmm. under the bylaw. Um, so we are we did submit a waiver request for that activity, um, but again that deck is no closer to Flint Pond than than that existing deck out there. Um, and then additionally, it's a pretty tall deck. Uh, I did I did submit some photos of it, uh, and it does allow some vegetation to grow underneath it. Um, and it's also because it's a deck by nature, it's not an impervious surface, um, so there's no addition of impervious surfaces associated with the deck expansion um, and, and the, the groundwater, or sorry, the, the stormwater can infiltrate into the ground um, underneath that deck. Um, and then also proposed is there are two, you can see in that photo, there's two saplings, they're not trees, they're, they're about 
four inches DBH. Um, and those are leaning pretty heavily um, over the existing dock at the site. Um, and the applicant's proposing to remove those two saplings. They are posing a uh, safety risk, uh, as well as a, a risk of property damage to that existing dock. Um, and that, that activity is within the 15 foot no disturbance zone. Um, but again, it's a safety hazard. Um, and then lastly, uh, if you scroll up, I believe, um, you'll see the existing uh, concrete stairs down to that dock. Um, and you can see that they're pretty narrow and, and pretty steep. You can't see the steep, just steepness that well, but it is very steep. Um, and then there's no railing there, so the applicant would like to propose a railing. Um, a portion of that railing would be within the 30-foot no structure and 15-foot no disturbance zone. Um, so we are submitting a waiver request for that activity, but again, it's a safety hazard. Um, and lastly, um, the project is located within a mapped priority habitat. Um, and we did submit a uh, project review checklist to NHESP and received a um, no-take determination letter from the NHESP program. Um, I think that was everything. If the commission has any questions, I'd be happy to address those. Diane. Okay, forgive me. I'm tired. It's 9 o'clock at night. <laughs> what do they understand? <laughs> um, Actually, I'd like a minute. Can you come sure. back to me? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Martha? Um, I understand saplings presenting a safety risk, um, but if you cut two growing trees near the shoreline, how are you going to mitigate that? We can, we can do as, as you would like, uh, some plantings if you'd like. Re replanting some trees, perhaps? Sure. Okay. Um, I think the railing is a fantastic idea. That looks like a very scary stairway. <laughs> and then my only other question is with the, the fence um, going around the property, is there a reason not to carry it all the way over to the driveway? It just seems like kind of an awkward space. It is going to be carried over to the side of the driveway. Yeah, it's the whole, like, so there's the house, then there's the attached, the garage. And then the survey ended up, I have a lot more land than I thought I did. <laughs> so it's going to fence in about two thirds of that side yard um, up to the driveway. Up to the driveway, okay. Because on the, on the existing plan, it's, you've got a, a weird little strip, wedge there. Yeah, of grass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, that's it. Yeah, that's not yeah. clear, but yeah. yeah. Chris? No additional questions. Andy? No, I'm all set. Leah? Does the, um, the corner of the porch where it comes out, is that, are you, do you need to add like another support mm. into the ground or you just? Probably two. two? Okay. Sorry. Do you know what kind, how that will be attached to ground? Uh, it'll probably be the same as the existing, so I believe it has sono tube. Okay, uh, sono tube attachment. Um, and then, yeah, do you know the species of the sapling or generally? The, the existing? Yeah, the two that uh, are coming down. They are birch, I believe. Okay. Possibly gray birch. I didn't confirm that, but okay. um, that was in my notes. Is that an acceptable replacement planting? Okay. Mm -hmm. And two is sufficient. And do you need that in the, like along the embankment, or would it be okay? Because there's a lot of existing veg vegetation in that area. Well, I think I think the intent is to help protect some of the shoreline, so it would be good to see it close to the lake. But you don't have to put it near the stairs. Okay, okay. Diane. Um, there was a question, and maybe you said this. There were a few things that you said that my brain was slower than what you were. Talking. Sorry, right. <laughs> this is about the border, uh, the 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 FEMA flood zone. Yes. Right. Um, do you do you have you calculated the BLSF um, for the BLSF uh, what the flood elevation is? I think you're referring to the DP comments. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. 
calculating it would be um, quite a project for a single family house owner to, to take on. So there is a provision for um, bordering land subject to flooding. Um, for the uh, highest uh, observed elevation of flooding to be used as the bordering land subject to flooding elevation. Um, we do have that. That was not used in this, um, in this application. We just digitized the extent of the mapping based on the FEMA flood zone maps. Um, if the commission wants to require that we add the flood floodplain elevation, we can, but um, again, it's a pretty steep uh, steep embankment, um, and I, I, would, I would be surprised if there was any bordering land subject to flooding on the site. Thank you. All well, set? Yeah. Anybody in the audience have any questions? Okay. Um, I guess we can close this hearing. Yeah. Okay, we'll close the hearing. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah. Yes. All right. We have a continued public hearing regarding a notice of intent filed by Lisa and Stephen Turnblum, 199 Gulf Street, Shrewsbury, for the construction of a single family home septic stormwater improvement systems at 195 Gulf Street. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Polito. Cool. We're ready when you're ready. Thank you, sir. May we ask that it be put on the screen? Thank you. It might make it a little bit easier for everybody. I can explain it from here, but that screen does work very well. Thank you very much. Uh, some small supplemental documentation in case this goes anywhere. It's just relative to the stream so that you'll have it in your file. I'm not saying that it has to be reviewed. Right now. So Thank just you. more information on Westbrook and some diversion of the stream system after it leaves Gulf Street. On a, on a brief one, the, the supplemental documentation is a Mr. Turnblum, I asked him to take some photos today. There's an error on USGS map. That error is that it shows that the stream flows behind the subject property where it actually doesn't. The main flow is to the, and in fact, it's described in my project description in the last documentation I gave to the commission, that the main flow comes out of, from underneath Gulf Street and veers to the right and flows around it's the first house you built up on a hill. 205. It flows to the north side of 205 and comes back around and, and behind the house that you live in now. Yeah. Oh, what, what house? Name? 199. At, behind 199, it circles back around and then comes into the brook that USGS shows. It's, it's on that documentation. Uh, the, the flow that shows on USGS maps, which are can be um, maybe a 20th at a time I find errors on their maps. Just did the market basket in Athol, and it was a major error on their mapping there on Route 2. But the point, and then we send them up to USGS and uh, to DEP to have revisions of USGS maps, and we're going to do it with this one. Uh, because historically, again, the flow is 
coming out of Gulf to the right, and there's a, hundred, there's a, a flooding event, overflow, which was dry today, did, well, did not have any flow in it, and we're at mean annual high, high water with the 1.7 inches of rain we just had and the 2.5 before that, 1.5 before that. As we all know, we're uh, pretty wet this, um, this, um, this uh, fall, both winter and spring. And so the photos show that there's no flow going down to Mr. Turnblum's existing driveway, nor behind us, and in fact, the water that the wetland behind this structure that's on the screen that uh, does not have a flow path connecting back with the main flow and um, under the regulation which we added into this documentation just for uh, so you'd have it in your file although we show photo documentation which we didn't have initially but we show both photo documentation of um, this flow path, this wetland behind Mr. Turnblum's proposed house, it states in the regulation, and I cited in what I gave you, but 1058, and this is under this one, a river in any natural, is any natural flowing body of water that empties to the ocean, lake, pond, or other river in which flows throughout the year. The point is there's no flow path of this wetland system behind Mr. Turnblum no defined flow path connecting to Westbrook to the rear of this house. So not only is this not the main flow, although USGS shows that, it also doesn't have a flow path. It's a wetland trickling through and eventually combines with the water that flows out of Gulf Street, bears to the right behind his original home, and then comes back to Westbrook. So it's a kind of a unique in, uh, situation, but we'll make sure that we just want to ensure that you have that in your file for any future discussions that might occur in other venues. So, so again, we have photo documentation similar to what we did across the street that this is, um, has, does dry up. We did come across that photo documentation and we submitted at the last meeting, not expecting that you had any time to review that documentation, which answers the questions from Kim Roth of DEP. That document was dated February 20th of 24, and you have it with Kim's in the red and my responses in the black. So I hope that you all had a time to, to look at this document. I, I know initially when I, well, it wasn't this project, it, the one across the street, I had submitted a 40-page document and there was some question by some people that they hadn't reviewed it. So going on to this lot, one of the questions is, can it be tightened up any? It's a two-bedroom home, which is allowed, and uh, the septic is, as we're facing the lot, is to the front left, over 50 feet from the wetlands. We, uh, there is no other place to put it. The house is sitting directly on the 50-foot setback, which uh, we've had discussions with other engineers and the engineer of record on this plan, that that's a variance that is not granted of, of moving that closer in this town. We have infiltration of the roof runoff, of the driveway, and we have a loss of 1,047 square feet with a replication of 1,096 replication. We've, as stated at the last meeting, we did go and, and investigated the soil in the replication area to guarantee that we had hydrology slash hydric soils within 12 inches of the final grade of the replication area. We've written, uh, because of Kim Roth's questions from DEP, we do offer, and we sh sure would like to see in your order of conditions, if you issue one, well, there will be some form of order, that we will uh, monitor the replication area. I, I am overseeing a replication tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. We do them readily, Framingham, everywhere else we're running them. Yesterday, 120,000 square foot irrelevant sturbage uh, that we're signing off that's all growing. You can't tell that it's uh, that wetland from the wetland adjacent to it. Rocks, stumps, the whole works, hydrology, plants. 75% surface area covered with indigenous plant species. 
So we'll, we're going to ensure that this replication meets those standards so that there can be a, a sign-off at the end with a certificate of compliance. And we obviously would not expect the commission to issue a certificate unless the replication meets all the standards under 310 CMR 10.554B 1 through 7, which is the 1 through 7 on how you make a wetland. And although it had been stated earlier that replica, even though it wasn't relevant to that project, we have been making wetlands since 86, and we have never failed. Because if you have hydrology, and you guarantee you have hydrology before you submit your plans, and then you ensure that you're overseeing the digging, and then you have that hydric soil within 12 inches of the final cut, which is the hydric soil is there, the low chromosomes are there, they're there because the hydrology is there. That's what reduced the iron from Fe3 to Fe2. And so if we're guaranteeing we have hydrology, then it just becomes soils, plants, and, and wetlands are no different than the glacier cutting the ground a little bit lower to access hydrology, and that's why the wetlands are there. So it's, it's not a major mystery. It's water table on replication. And so, and it's all obviously indigenous plant species and it's the density. We always plant and we can go a little bit tighter. We plant seven, seven foot spacing uh, of my four major woody plants, the red maple, kaibush blueberry, northern arrowwood, and carmen winterberry, along with wet meadow seed mix from New England wetland plants, who are my clients also. And, we, uh, and that's how we work to make wetlands and that, that's, that's what we have on this plan. We realize it's, as you all have put us in this category on your, on your sheet, the following hearings are not subject to the Shrewsbury Wetland Bylaw. We don't have to restate that. We, unlike the major project that was in, in front of you before, well, I guess they should have moved a little bit quicker and filed before the bylaw came in. Well, when you don't, then you're subject to the bylaw. So. This has been in front of you. We, the floodplain study, which was done under construction for the FEMA floodplain, originally studied by McNeil Engineering and then picked up by Mr. Grenier and another engineer, as I recall. That study has been submitted, and FEMA has worked to approve it with just formatting changes. And uh, that's why that project, this is, which this is uh, originally under, is now under construction, downgrading of this property. I'm just sorry, looking for that stud. There it is. I do get messy. So um, MP Design and John Grenier Associates, that January 23. The, that's what's uh, the project of 55 and over? Yeah. 55 and over is off now. Off of Cyprus. Off of Cyprus is now working off. That, that whole study covers up to this Gulf Street property. And so that's what we used um, here. And I believe I've covered most of what at this moment I would have to say. I do appreciate the Commission's time in hearing me. Thank you. You all set? Yes, sir. Uh, so um, I just want to make sure of two small things. Um, you may have said it, and I may have missed it. Uh, so the monitoring monitoring period would be for at least two years? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the next one is okay. that um, uh, you would um, have to achieve, like, 75% survival of plants. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, great. That's, that's so all I have. No, um, what are the wetland wet replication requirements in terms of square footage for or the or the ratio for the alteration, sir? Thank you. Uh, under state law, it's one to one. One to one. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm all set. Chris. So I'll follow on to Martha's comment. What's your replication amount? What's the ratio that you're doing? Uh, we're just over one to one. We're at. We're almost 50 square feet, but we'll make sure every square foot of our replication. We stake out the replication area. Oh, everything's staked out before we work. The house corners, the septic, the
the driveway, the replication area, the erosion controls will be put in by S&M Farms out of Fitchburg, Lemonster. Uh, they'll be entrenched, there'll be wattles, but the, again, the specific replication area will be laid out so we get all square footage. And, if there, and we normally see an as-built requirement for both the lost and the replication area. Uh, we have driveways we're doing now where we've seen them got called in and the replication might be there, but the driveway, I just did one in Sturbridge, I inherited it. it, the driveway was wider than what the plan called for. So we ensure that everything we do is staked in the field and the contract, uh, exactly limited work, which is our erosion control, but the replication will be staked <coughs> specifically. I will be overseeing the replication areas uh, we will ensure that we have rich 18 to 20 percent organic by weight organic soil because we might have a problem getting that one foot of organic that we put in our replications. We have a replication detail on the detail sheet and uh, that replication detail, I originally uh, built that for one of your town engineers, Franz Zaretti, back in 87. I modified it and made it and improved it in 2007 and that will explain how I make a wetland by, uh, by the one foot depth of organic. And we're on, uh, let me just see. The replication is in the lower left corner of the front page. And uh, it calls for, because of our square footage, it's seven red maple. Also, the red maples, we're not going to go with, we will not go with just little whips, which is normally what New England wetland plants plants. We will go with, and if the commission requires something different, but we're, we normally go with anywhere from one to two inch caliper on the red maples to get the forest going quickly. The bushes, we normally that buy all our bushes. See, New England wetland plants does not have them that big. They're small, three, four, they, they go through so many that they're mostly selling seedlings, even with their bushes. That, but, but so the saplings, we want to get a red maple get going quicker, so we'll buy those, uh, pay the money for that, uh, those to be bigger. But the uh, other stuff, the high bush, the cinnamon, excuse me, the northern arrow and the common winterberry, we um, get those from New England wetland plants and they're normally three to five feet. But they're a smaller th three. I met very, really, I'm getting them five. We just bought some, we'll be picking up tomorrow. They just started selling about three to four weeks ago. Again, they just opened their nursery, South Hadley. And, um, and then the cinnamon fern, we always, so we, there's a ratio of a 0.02 times the square footage. How did you come up with seven, Glenn? Multiply because um, New England Wetland Plants actually has a chart in the back of their book. And so whatever density you're looking at, five foot uh, on, on center spacing, six foot, seven, eight. Well, each one has a, a decimal that you multiply into it, if you've seen them, you multiply. So at uh, seven foot spacing, it's 0.02 times the square footage of loss will give you the number of plants. And then we, so, so if we get um, whatever the number is, it must be seven times four, because I don't include the cinnamon fern. Those always go to what the number it turns out. So I take my four woodies, I multiply, I divide that into my number that I get up from the 1047 times 0.02. I come up with the figure, I divide that by four, that gives me my seven a piece of my woodies. Then I just add in seven cinnamon because normally whatever I'm getting for woodies, I, I put that same number in for cinnamon or ostrich or, or whatever. Sometimes the cinnamon not available, but ostrich are native. Um, we, that's the, that's the um, fiddlehead that you buy in the market. So we do find them. They're, they're Burton and Rowinski have a book of uh, vascular plants of Worcester County. They're, they're shown to be ostrich in, in uh, Shrewsbury. So we, we go by Burton and Rowinski on that vascular plants of Worcester County, which I know Robert Burton well. He's an ex-Holy Cross professor, so we all know Robert. And anyways, that's how I come up with what I'm going to be doing on the replication and overseeing and ensuring I have hydrology. Okay. In, in the square footage. You good? Yeah. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Andy, I'm all set right now. Leah? Um, did we, I'm sorry, I, I might have be looking at the wrong plan too. Did we get the details for the, um, you proposed granite posts at the edge of the wetland? Did we get details for those with the signage? Or the we, language we, of the signage? Um, 
I think we had informally discussed it at, we informally at some point, and I was wondering what the final decision was. That we're going to give you monuments, and I thought what Mr. Green, yeah, they're on Mr. Green, it's up here at the top of the plan. Okay, I'm, just, I'm scrolling around in such tiny detail, I can't find anything. Yeah, that's right. okay. Four by four granite posts no, with no lacquered, no six no inches problem. above. Yep. Ground. Yep. Thirty-six and below those ground. Po posts will be what construction? Granite. Granite. Okay. And we'll take whatever placard that you want on that. We we just ordered them from Millbury. And uh, the versified signs on 169 can make it any kind of placket or, or monument or stick on that you want on the mm -hmm. top of those. Or if some towns want a post, and these are aluminum that we're making for Millbury. Okay. Not going. So we, we see them, Natick Framingham, everywhere that most everybody now wants placket or some kind of monument. Uh, Worcester, we just did them for the city of Worcester buses over there. We, that was one of my permits on um, Northeast Cutoff. So, so, yes, that's what we're going to do because we did talk about them. We, we work with Mr. Grenier very closely, and we appreciate that, that anything you, that you were looking for, we can get on the plan. And I'm sorry, did those make, uh, how many would be on the, um, how many would be installed? They are shown. Are they on there? Plan is an old Are they on a different? Okay. We, I was looking at a new plan, but it didn't have the um, planting, the replication area, so I, I switched plans. But let me switch back. I, I believe I, I was looking for my plan. I'll have to. My son works for me for nine years. I'll have to uh, like get them like this because uh, yeah, I they do show them. They just they kind of get lost. That, that was one of the final things I put on the plan. The monuments. So get those big. the two. two. Yeah, they're like the little square. They're yeah. showing. It's just they're yeah. going to get lost in the line work. Okay. So there's one, two, three, four, one, two, five, three, six, four, seven six, proposed? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, yeah. Seven proposed. Seven. Yeah. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that those are okay. made it to a plan. Okay. Anybody in the audience have any questions? Are we all set in the board? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll close the hearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commission. All right, we have a um, continued public hearing regarding Novus Vintent, filed by Medeiros Gaccione, 115 with these cut off Realty Trust. One West Boylston Street, Worcester, for the construction of two commercial buildings with parking, driveways, and commercial loading areas, as well as two stormwater BMPs at 369 Holland Street. Do you guys plan? I do have probably have the um at minimum I have the superseded ones if not awesome up on screens yes. right, cool. um, I think we've all seen this project before but uh, I'll refresh everyone so uh, and you are first of all I'm Nikita Shigru I uh, engineer at Thompson Liston and I'm Seth Liston, Thompson -Liston. All right. so 
we're looking at putting up the lot and proposing a 12,000 square foot office space on the northerly side, which is the left side in plan view, and then a 50,000 square foot warehouse building there on the southerly side. Access to the office building from Holden Street, access to the warehouse from Northeast Cutoff, um, deep sump catch basins, uh, hydrodynamic separators, and uh, infiltration for all. Aaliyah, uh, could you switch off to sheet C2, please? Which is the fourth page, maybe? One, two, three. There we go. That one, yep. Thank you. So you can see north is left. Access from Holden Street for the northerly building, access from Northeast Cutoff from the southerly building. All paved areas are treated with deep sump catch basins, hydrodynamic separators um, before infiltration. And then we had some comments from last meeting that we had addressed, so we can uh, go through those. We had conducted those additional uh, infiltration test pits there within the footprints of all um, infiltration basins proposed there. And we found where we're within four feet of high ground water, we've now conducted mounding analyses. So that is uh, for three of the ponds, which uh, you can see them labeled on sheet C3. See those test pits with the most. Um, now that we sized up those ponds, we've also calculated the required uh, riprap for the discharges, which is very minimal discharge in the hundred year <coughs> storm. And those calculations are also included in the stormwater report. We added in the 30 foot no structure and 15 foot no touch buffers. And we've gotten all disturbance out of those 15 foot buffers. We've fully designed the septic systems now so we can label the setbacks and show that we are safely outside the required buffers and also uh, set a safe distance away from infiltration with those. And we have also labeled the setbacks of all infiltration outflows to the wetland. Uh, we now have those planting plans for your review as well. of the additional information you've asked for is included in the stormwater report. That's all we got at this point. If you have some questions that we can help yeah. you with. Um, Diane? I don't have any questions at this time. Martha? Um, I have a comment. I would love for you to consider more native species in the planting plan. Dawn redwood is exotic. It's not native. Um, I don't okay. really think we need we, it in Shrewsbury. We can absolutely do that. Thank you. And the viburnum placatum is also a, an uh, Asian species. Okay. So if you we'll find another viburnum, that. we have some natives that would be nice. Okay, absolutely. Okay. Okay, Chris. I'm all set. Andy. Um, I mean, it's somewhat related, but I've, has the resolution on the water supply for the buildings been resolved? That hasn't been resolved yeah, yet. Yeah. That's why that's, it's not shown on the plan. That, yeah, you might put a well exactly, in it. Exactly. That's okay. 
Yeah, there are some options out there. It hasn't been decided. So one has a water supply and one doesn't? This, so the Shrewsbury has no water up there. Right. And we don't have an intermissible agreement with Worcester to supply water to this site. They're, so. sh they're showing a tap. Did on, I miss it? On sheet C5. Hmm. That was, that's what I was looking for. I couldn't see it. Seriously. Connect to water main with six inch tapping sleeve and gate. Coordinate with Worcester Water Operations. Right. For the larger building. Okay. But it's, I mean, it goes. Well, I don't think we meant to show that because I don't think we have that on our plan here. So that might have just been um, a provision before, but we haven't fleshed that out yet. So oh, it's that. Is it, it's on the landscape plan? It's on C5. C5. Oh. No, it's on the one What's I the date on your yeah, plan set? Yeah, C5, the one I It's um, the, uh, 822, 23. 23. Eight, okay, 822. So our okay. latest edition is the 822, 23. So if you have a revised these, these edition. These ones they just handed us. These are 318, 24. The, no, the the big one that's right that's just in yeah. front of you two is... Yeah. Um, the superseded is the, one. That might have been the, the previous have... submission. Oh. Yeah, is the superseded one. The only okay. new thing that I received this evening was the landscaping plan. Landscape plan. Okay, gotcha. so, okay. so we need a new They certainly have... leave this with you, but yeah. we can deliver. And then, yeah, if you could submit uh, yeah, three hard copies of full-size up to the to date plan. Absolutely. But that tap is not shown on yeah, our we, current plans. So we're going to need a, revi full re a revised set showing yeah, what Yeah, that's fine. Done. We can, we'll leave this one with you today, and we'll get you three full-size copies. But in order for us to kind of issue an order of conditions, don't you need to have, like, a water supply? To, I mean, is that something that we need? To well, if they're going to do a well, we need to see where it is on the site, right? right. I mean, there's water down at, we did, when we did the Clinton the Street, there's water down at Clinton. We're right. going to have to bring it up to serve the site. So you need to make, are you going to looking into different alternatives? Is that what we you are? Mm -hmm. Is a well a possibility? That part of town? In theory, yeah. I did, was just wondering how Shrewsbury was doing with, uh, with water supply. Yeah, well, this should Blackstone. be a private well, so I mean, they, can, they can put a private well on there. I mean, yeah. the issue they're going to run into is fire protection. Commercial. How to meet the fire protection yeah. code. Yes. Okay. Holding tanks, but. Obviously, we can't. We, we issue, I mean, we could approve it, but we won't be able to issue a building permit. There's no water. So, gotcha. So you'll come back to us with a, a revised set of plans that shows. Hopefully, you can figure that out before you come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. I hate to give you an order conditions for something that you can't build. That's fair. So, <laughs> the the intent is, we we haven't filed yet with planning. Uh, and that is certainly going to be something that is uh, figured out uh, before planning can uh, act on it. So it's a, uh, it is something that is being discussed, um, but it wasn't. It, I'm not sure it's something that we're going to have uh, a, a direct answer for right away. It's so kind you, of a, it's it's a big. So you have to go to planning anyway. So we do. Just, we have just keep it open until it gets. Yeah, because Worcester hasn't approved it either. Right. Oh, Worcester, yeah, so you got Worcester too. Okay. Um, All right, so you'll ask for a continuance? I did want to, I don't, um, we we received a letter from the, a letter of support from the Greater Worcester Land Trust. I we did see that. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to elaborate on that or if, if the revised plans would include the where will be protected or so, how fleshed that out that is. Yeah, that, uh, so we just received that that letter um, it is something that has been discussed um, with the applicant um, but not no defined area has been decided yet it they have uh, a similar agreement with their property uh, across northeast cutoff from this property in Worcester um, it's a rather large uh, conservation restriction on the property and um, something similar to that uh, set up is what they're discussing for this one, but that uh, designation, that, that delineation hasn't been done yet. Okay. Okay. Anybody in the audience have any questions or concerns? No. So, this, so we'll continue this okay. to the future. All right.
right. On to uh, new and old business, uh, discuss and sign orders of mm -hmm. conditions. Orders of conditions and then. Mr. Chairman, I move that we issue an order of conditions for 7 Flanagan Drive. Okay. For the construction of a single family house and driveway. And that was the, that, is there a second? Second. And that was the uh, um, uh, that's just where the building just came out that's where they, where they changed because the there wasn't an order this is for the um this is the amended order yeah. amended order yes for the, the walls the and the yeah so elevation. this will be the addition of the walls as well as the rise and elevation because so the house is already kind of built the house is totally constructed right. it is a shell of a house i don't know what it looks like inside but it is you could look it looks like a home okay. um so yeah it just needs its retaining wall so that house doesn't the slope There's doesn't fall out from underneath it. Added row of erosion control as well. Okay. And you you would ask for erosion, another row of erosion control. So an additional ero bear, the, 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 an additional line of erosion control was has already been installed okay. on the inside of the existing line because they've had erosion control issues throughout construction. Okay. And that was why they originally had received an enforcement order. Okay. All right. So we. Yeah, a second. second. Seconded. Chris seconded. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I do recommend the special condition that um, construction or conservation seed mix be installed <coughs> in the, I'm not really sure what to call it. There's like a weepy spot at the bottom of the erosion control. It's like, it's a little pop-up wetland. Is that what he said he would uh, watch? Yes. That is what he would um, watch and put the yes, seed down. Yes, he had planned to okay. put the conservation seed mix, but I would like to okay. memorialize that right. in writing. We'll add that to writing. Okay. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I move that we issue an order of conditions for 54 Lakeside Drive for the construction of a patio deck, staircase, and fence, and removal of two saplings with the condition that the saplings be replaced um, with equivalent or identical species and a caliber DBH of one to two inches. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And Mr. Chairman, I move that we issue an order of conditions for the construction of a single family home septic system and stormwater systems at 195 Gulf Street with any special conditions to be discussed. Right. They, do we have a second? Second. And, um, didn't they say they're going to put the signage in on the monuments? Do we need to more, uh, discuss what we want for sign it for the wording? Wording know? on the signs, or is that something? Well, they have wording on the plans. They have wording on the yeah, plans. I mean, that's, okay. Did the wording on the plans um, suffice? I guess. Let me see what the wording. I on couldn't the read it. I'll throw a second. Second. It says. Protected wetlands, no alteration. Any additions? To me. Sounds good. Pretty straight to yeah, the point. That's, fine. I mean, that's, that, that's perfect. The, the, the point. only thing that, that bothers me about that is that is his assertion about the flow of the stream being inconsistent with the, the USGS map. Is there any way to, to, or do you all feel that that's been sufficiently? Well, there was a, yeah, because the house across the street, DEP, said it was an intermittent stream. No, I don't think. But okay. he, he's actually talking about the flow of it. Yeah, but whether it's, if it's less, it's a you know perennial stream. It's got no riverfront, so it's kind of off, off site from this project. I don't disagree. So it I, I so don't disagree. It does go the other way. It goes down through the Greenbrier property. It makes more sense than what it's shown on the USGS map, but I don't think it affects this project per se. Yeah. Okay. As long as it doesn't impact it. Okay. So we had a second. Yeah, we have a second. So any, any other discussion? We all good? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 
And that, that, would, that would be it, correct? Mm -hmm. That is it. That's it for the orders. Okay. All right, certificates of compliance. Oh. I don't know, do you want to do enforcement since we have sure. people here? Sure, we can do enforcements. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one green bar. Mm -hmm. you, you have three. Mm -hmm. I can sign what? Okay. Mm -hmm. That came up there. Good evening, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the commission. My name is Matt Morrow. I am an environmental consultant and the one of two people with the firm Matthew S. Morrow Environmental Consulting out of Lemonster. Um, like Mr. Kravosky, the other employee is my son. Um, I'm here this evening <coughs> representing the uh, development team over at Greenbrier Drive. So what had happened, as the commission is probably well aware, based on the enforcement order issued by your agent, um, there was an incident at the site where a beaver, an old beaver dam was removed. The area currently um, in the development envelope doesn't have any beaver activity. Currently, it's old beaver activity. Beaver has long since left that site. I got called down once that incident happened. I looked at the site, spoke with your agent on the phone. First thing I noticed immediately was the material that was removed from the dam actually was removed like it was, it was a very old dam. So the, the stuff had been well established and it was actually removed um, remarkably as one big plug. So I looked at this and I said, okay, it's draining an area where there is vernal activity up in the backside. Before this thing starts to go through, the, before the vernal pools around there start going through their flowering phase, um, let's put the plug back in. What I mean by flowering phase is that they start hatching, they start utilizing the resources in the later part of the spring when the, the pools start to actually dry out you know, from the late spring heat. That's what I mean by flowering phase. Um, I figured the easiest remedy to start is to plug it back up, let the water rise. Right now, um, we are in the middle of ensuring that the dam that's been rebuilt and put back in place is holding. Some of the water level is actually above even the pre-existing levels prior to the dam being removed. So we're kind of tweaking it a little bit to make sure that you know it, it stays at the level it was previously and doesn't over flood the area because we don't want it to neg negatively impact the remainder of the wetland. In other words, there's other vernal pool species over there. We don't want to start flooding things out. We don't want to start pushing water back up into people's backyards on the abutting properties, etc. cetera. Um, I am going to be continuing to monitor the site to ensure that there were no deleterious effects on the vernal pools. Um, there's, there's a lot of salamanders and wood frogs out there. Usually in that area, about when I've been out there between 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you hear the frogs start to really sing. Uh, it's kind of cool. They're, they're pretty loud. You just got to love that sound. That's where we are currently. Um, I don't know if the team has anything else they want to say or you guys want to talk to me some more about it, about what next steps are, what you guys want to see, et cetera. I know I had been talking to your agent about maybe – making little breaks in areas of the erosion control where we're not going to be working right now to um, allow migration out of those areas. So I'm, I'm examining that and I'm going to continue to interact with your office on that and move forward. But that's basically it. I'm, I'm trying, considering the, if I seem a little bit tenuous, it's because it's so late and I just don't want to keep going on and on, so. Okay. Uh, Alea, can you give us a, any insight to what happened? Um, so I was, I guess, called out um, and a butter noticed that the, the wetland had significantly dropped. So I went out to, to see that the, um, the old dam had been removed. Um, and uh, then we had a, con a meeting with the, uh, the, then we had the pre-construction meeting. Sorry, my brain is also slowly shutting down. 
Um, and no one was able to identify how the, um, the blockage had been removed. So I, I would love to get a little clarification and some assurance going forward that that kind of extremely egregious accident doesn't just happen again. Because um, that, yeah, you sig it significantly altered the wetland mm -hmm. <laughs> during a very important time of year. Um, and then, yeah, so then, and then after that, the enforcement order was issued. Um, then erosion control was installed on the site. Um, and then, yeah, we, I was in discussion with Matt to restore that, um, the dam. And now we're here. And, and what's going on on the site now? Um, I haven't been back out since the <clears throat> dam was restored. Um, so I will have to get out there um, tomorrow or later this week. I mean, there's no site work going on because we said cease and desist. Yeah. Until they at least came here tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if we want, you know, so environmental study of what the impacts are of this wetland. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out how it happened, right? I mean, you don't just how, how, take yeah, a so bobcat into there and drip. So how did, is this, and this is obviously in a wetland, so how did you get a machine out <laughs> beyond with the area of your work? Well, there's... I can speak to what happened and how it happened. And, who, and um, you are, excuse me. Who oh, excuse me. I'm Dave Zirko, uh, principal of Titan Contractors. Um, what basically happened was when we were, um, we had the pre-construction meeting, and prior to that, we were planning on doing erosion control at S&M Farms. And we had a small machine out there to fill in the ruts because, um, if you're familiar with that site, it's behind the houses, which are, are filled, and there's a, a low area, which is going to be the center line of the road. And from the previous contractor, um, he had a lot of ruts um, that were holding water. So the intent was the machine was to go there to fill in the ruts so that when S&M Farms came, they could have a clear path out to do the erosion control. Unbeknownst to me at the time, the operator took it upon himself to remove the sticks from the beaver dam and lower the uh, water that was built up behind it uh, running down the stream. Now, I wasn't aware of any of that happening until after this all came to light. So um, I spoke with him about it after we had the pre-construction meeting, and Leah had mentioned that um, there was some activity out there. Um, and I forget the gentleman's name that said that it was a small machine out there. Um, and um, to access that area, that's actually a hard, dry peninsula that leads out to where that dam was. There's an old, what appears to be an old stone wall or, or culvert or crossing there, which is quite narrow. It's only six feet. And that's, so he was able to walk out there and just sit there and pluck that out with the uh, thumb and just place it on the ground next to it. Um, and when I confronted him about this, he had told me that, yeah, he did that, and that was not under my direction or anyone's direction. He took it upon himself to do it. And since that time, he is um, no longer employed with us. That was his own doing. I was, you know, ultimately the responsibility lands on me, and I brought that to his attention, but he um, is no longer with us. Um, so that's how this thing um, started, and um, then the, um, we, we did not receive the enforcement order for several days after it was put out there. That's why we were out there that uh, Monday, I believe, uh, continuing to install the erosion control. And Kim, the office manager, can speak to how we did not receive the um, enforcement order until later that week. Um, you want to speak on that, Kim? Yeah, our, our office is closed on the weekend. There's no, none of the offices are open. There's no, like, outside mail drop. So I don't know when it came in, but I know <coughs> that we had a message that said we could pick it up after the 9th. And that's all we got. We found out from your email that it was issued. We didn't even know. So hmm. our mail... It's funny because there's not that many people in the building, so the when the front door's locked, the mail can't get in. There's no slot. Okay. Yeah, so I think probably that's what happened, and they just left us a notice, and like I said, it said that we could pick it up after the 9th. Okay. 
And once that happened, and once we were aware of it, we, we uh, stopped S&M Farms from continuing to install. There was a small portion of the erosion control left to finish, um, but it, um, we just, we abandoned the job um, at that point, you know, honoring the enforcement order um, for no, you know, not to do any work on the site. Is this the area on screen? Yes, yeah, so this is where you can see where the, um, to the north, the, the, the large uh, wetland area connects to the little streamway that you can kind of see running south across the. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I, could I go to the TV screen for one second? Sure. But we can't see that TV screen. Okay. We can see it down um, there. On yeah. The, yeah. Can you? <laughs> okay, I'll go to this TV screen. Thank you. <coughs> um, okay, so just to point out the area where the beaver dam was, was actually, there's a large, there's an area when you first go in Cypress, you come off the Cypress, you go into Greenbrier, and you start going through the woods, there's actually an existing cart path that goes through there. That part of that cart path was the area that when Art Allen was doing his review, um, it was previously delineated by Waterman Design for the other part of the development. And when we were out there, we discovered that, you know, beaver activity had kind of spread the wetland out. Um, so there is an area of wetland that they do have to cross over, even when they're traveling through the equipment that they're going to be filling and replicating as part of the approved plan. But it does lead to a rock outcropping, which then leads to where the beaver dam was basically over here. And if you look at the pre-existing conditions on the original site plan, what you'll see right across where that beaver dam was, it, what has appeared to be a drawn in as a stone wall. So that area had an impoundment historically. Um, I looked at the rock structure that's left there and it looked more to me like it was an old spillway. Um, so obviously the people were gonna try to dam that thing up and they did. And they kept the water levels up. Why they abandoned the area, I don't know. But the chew that was out there was very old. Um, and the plain fact is, by the time I got out there, which was a few days after I was alerted to what was going on, um, the dam hadn't been rebuilt. So there's obviously no beaver activity out there because they would have been fresh chew and a new dam out there pretty fast. They would have been out there already. Um, fortunately, <coughs> the former crew member that Mr. Zerko described when he took that out most of it actually came out in one plug it wasn't like a pile of sticks were just crunched with like a claw and left out there was it was actually sticks mud it was very I mean it was very very hard to clever little critters so we decided to take their um, architectural skills and their engineering skills and utilize that part of it along with the crew hand making a lot of the rest of what's up there now. Um, it's holding very well. Again, I will continue to monitor the site to ensure um, there were no deleterious effects to any of the species in that area. Um, honestly, I think we caught it just in time. They went out there, they got it up just before the last rainstorm. Everything's back up. Thankfully. Thank Thankfully, it didn't happen during the middle of like an early drought like in 22. So, Leah, what, what do we what do you suggest we do to move forward? Um, do you want to have a, uh, somebody go out and, and review this prior to them starting again, or what would you Yeah, do? I think a, um, it's setting up definitely a, a, um, a stricter monitoring schedule at minimum um, would be good, just so it's not like, oh, I had time today, I'll go see how Greenbrier's doing. It's, you know, every week or every, um, and that might want to last for the, the, duration of the project, just so we're making sure this isn't happening again. Um, if I may interject here real quick, just, yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this, but I'm also a certified stormwater inspector. So I'm the inspector that's been hired to do the SWIP inspections on the job. Okay. So, so not only will I be out there like at a minimum of every week mm -hmm. checking the area and after it rains a quarter of an inch, I'm also gonna be supervising the replication. Um, so I'm gonna be out there all the time. And, it is going to be a schedule. We can review that with you. Okay. Yeah, so it might be added to that. Right. Because, um, yeah, that's looking for erosion control. And this would be looking at. Right. Mr. Mr. V Mr. Venencaza normally has me do his erosion control inspections on any project that he's involved with. Yeah, so this would just be a little, a little more than that because I know 
to exactly the, the stormwater ones are aimed at just how's the erosion control doing and this would be more of a how is the wetland itself doing um i don't know if we want a third party to also kind of go out there and be like well how 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 has this affected the do you want to have a third party go out and then and see what happened now the yeah impact. and just kind of do a review now and then give us a report and then they can then from there on they can do theirs and maybe periodically have somebody come look at it. I yeah, we might. So they might have. About art. I would okay. say yes. Yeah, we probably yeah, would. Did the original employ. delineation. So. Yeah, so he might have familiarity with the site. Well, you were, <coughs> yeah, he's very familiar with the site. Him and I both reviewed the delineation I had done on my part together, and actually, Mr. Allen and I just worked on a vernal pool issue over in Holden. Okay. Um, I work with art a lot. And 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 you just did one with 170 Hartford Turnpike. Mm -hmm. The one in Shrewsbury was just 170 Hertford. Yep. <clears throat> should um, should they at least complete the erosion co control at, at this point and get that um, all established? I probably. So the the one caveat would be the continued um, allowance for critters yeah, to get openings. from uh, the wetland to the upland area because it still is. Right. Spotted salamander time. Oh, it, it's the, the problem is that they, they got to the pool without any trouble. All the salamanders and the frogs got there just fine because there was no, there was no, um, there was nothing to stop them, which is great. But now there's a wall and they haven't all returned yet upland. So the timing of putting in the erosion control is really very poor for them. Yeah, we can take care of that. Uh, I do notice that the wood frog activity um, that I've been hearing and that I've been seeing is actually on the opposite side of where they yeah. have the hay bales. Luckily. So now would be a good time to get in there and actually just start staggering those bales mm -hmm. um, before they have to go use their little legs. And it's amazing how far they can get on little legs. They so, go pretty far. Yeah. Yeah, they, but they have to get out of the pool. Oh, I, you, you're, you, yeah. I, we're on the same page. Great. Okay. <laughs> and, so. and then when it's time for the the new generation to leave, they need the pools, which is about midsummer. Uh, it well, it depends. It depends. Average is average is early summer, like June. Okay, um, they can like I have vernal pools that are called I call them late bloomers because they don't even start showing any activity until mid June because they're so heavily shaded. They're in Gardner, by the way, um, <coughs> right near where they want to expand the sludge landfill. Um, we actually had them reduce the volume by half um, because they wanted to go right into three vernal pools. And they're what's called late bloomers. So the, they actually maintain a thin ice layer until like early June because it's so heavily shaded. And then in mid-June, the ice disappears and the fairy shrimp just come right out. It's amazing. But to get back to your question, it would be like mid to late June. Okay, so can we also make provisions for gaps in the erosion controls to allow the movement away from the vernal pools for the baby, baby frogs and salamanders? Should the gaps be staggered or something? Yeah, so again, I mean, they, they, you would want to you would want to stagger the bales so that they're like this, so they can still have some effect on erosion control. Yeah. It would only have to be in a limited area of the site. So if they're allowed to start doing work, they can concentrate on areas downstream from where we would do the staggering. And then when the later summer comes, they can fill in those gaps. And then after the winter, we can make sure those gaps are addressed again. That would encompass removal of the sill fence. That, it, yeah. it, it would. Yeah. yeah. Now the yeah. erosion control is, there's, Along the brook and the, the wetland, that's all been installed. The only part that isn't is where the stone wall is and it runs up to the power lines. That um, is 820 feet. That's the only thing that's left to do as far as the erosion control goes. I guess the question is, would we want to stagger that erosion control going up the hill? Um, we, they go uh, like the, the half goal, a mile sometimes. Well, the, the, About what that is. The goal is to keep this a functioning biological habitat as much as we can during construction. And it sounds like you have a good understanding of how that works. Um, and that's also something Art and I can talk about while we're out there too. 
That would be great. I often find when the two of us put our heads together, we usually come up with a good strategy that addresses everybody's mm -hmm. needs. Okay. Thank you. So the plan would be to get Art out there to do his inspection, and then um, if he, if with with Matt, and um, and then if they concur, would they be able to start work? How how do you want? Yeah, um, I think so. So yeah, the the. When would your SWIP inspections? When do your SWIP inspections usually start? Once erosion control is installed? Once, once the erosion controls are installed and you give them the ability to start, well, I'm going to be down there before anyway, but when they start working, when they start putting shovel to ground, okay. that's when I start. When they submit, they get their EPA number. If, I believe they have that already. Do and it's posted. Right. So, but so we typically, the SWIPs, after we have a, the initial inspection from, from the, the agent, you, mm -hmm. then we would... Um, contact Matt and tell him we're underway and he would start the clock on the SWIPs uh, reporting, keeping his log, mm -hmm. which, um, um, and then that would be, like he said, he would do it weekly or a storm event, and, um, and then whatever steps were taken to remediate whatever happened, the way it rains now, it's hard to tell what's going to happen. Um, That's yeah. a concern. Yeah, so uh, the... the <laughs> Part of the, the third party review will probably be developing what will be necessary to be turned in every week as part of so in addition to that, you know, standard SWIP, here's how the erosion control is doing, what will be necessary to ensure that like the wetland is still doing A okay from week to week and we can be tracking any, you know and I'm not sure what's gonna go in though, so <laughs> that might be um yeah, what what might be helping to catalog that, but we want to make sure on that weekly basis that that we are seeing any changes in the wetlands that are yeah Matt well normally what well, normally what I would do is I would submit whatever required monitoring reports you have in the ordering conditions for the replication area and then I would also if you guys want them I will usually email out the SWIP reports monthly mm -hmm. so unless there's a breach if there's a breach you're notified immediately upon discovery of the breach um, I can do that but in the meantime in between I can also give you email status reports a couple photos, okay, things are looking good here, things are looking... Yeah. Sometimes just something like that weekly takes 10 minutes for me to do, but it just keeps a good tickler file moving of how things are moving along. Yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, that would be the good, the while a plan is in development, a weekly monitoring report of how it's going would be perfect. Um, So yeah, the first step will be we'll see if uh, when Art or someone from Ecotech can get out there to, to talk with you um, and schedule that, and then we can start those um, weekly inspections based on the plan that you guys come up with, and if there's anything else that needs to be incorporated into that. Okay, so you 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 handle it, and then that's so. and then when they're ready to go, they're, they're ready to go. You mm -hmm. let them know. Yeah. And then I'll, he'll look at the area that was disturbed and to see if there's anything else that needs to be done there. Yeah, I think we should yeah. monitor through the, mm -hmm. the breeding season until okay. so June, just to make sure it's functioning like it should. A longer term consideration might be uh, when the roadway goes in, incorporating somehow for the critters <coughs> to cross the roadway, um, because there there will be a roadway along like betwixt underneath? upland and wetland in permanence, so Indeed. that might be something to consider for future. Well, let's get going with this, and then yes. we can cross that bridge. Okay? Literally. Yeah. <laughs> cross that bridge. I heard the phrase. Okay. <laughs> so you'll work it out with Alea, and you'll have Echo Tech do a review, and then once she's comfortable, she'll give you the okay. Yes, Mr. Chair. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, there's a question. What is the question? Yes, ma'am. Come right up to the... I'm right up. No, don't die. I'll be sure and brief. I it's appreciate okay. all the uh, no, effort everyone's putting in. I forgot. Uh, you. <laughs> Go ahead. What's your name? Hi, my name is George Miles. I live at Six Woodwood Land. I'm the director of butter to the property. Um, I'd like to get a clarification from the gentleman here in the vest. You mentioned that a beaver structure was removed. 
right? Yes, I believe that's what this whole thing is about. The, okay. It was removed and replaced. It was put back. So you were you were aware of this prior? I'm trying was, to. Okay. So I was made aware of it after the fact. Okay. I went so. out there. They said, "What do we do?" I said, "You need to put it back," and that's what we did. My my whole thing is, is you know, how do we get here? At the end of the day, why are we here? Why are we talking about this? And, and like you mentioned, we have a gentleman who's very knowledgeable about what the right way to do this, and we've done everything exactly the opposite. Um, you know, if you look at it, it was excavating soil, uh, vegetation, earth moving, you know, road building, all this that you're supposed to, you know, uh, and you know, uh, pay attention to the commission's order of, of uh, conditions. None of this happened. There was no silt fence. There was no um, hay bales. All this was done. Um, and it was done, I don't want to say, it was a premeditated action in some ways, right? So you had a survey to go out there to find the beaver. Did you ever find a lodge, by the way? Did you really find any kind of, I mean, those are pretty easy to find, correct? There was no hut in the area of the property. I've been living in that location for 24 years. I have seen bear. I have seen ferret. I have seen every creature in the world except a beaver and a muskrat. Never seen one. If you go down there, you will not. You will normally see vegetation, and you will see, um, you know, uh, small trees chewed on. I've seen 36-inch oak trees brought down by beavers. There is not one slit, one piece of evidence to show a beaver has been down there in the last 24 years that I've been down. And if you looked at the riprap that was there, it was just deadfall. If you look at the condition that with the, uh, the excavator, if we say it's a small piece of equipment, it's an excavator. It wasn't a small piece of equipment. It was a rather large piece of equipment. We went in there. One section, there was a whole a pile of mud. Another section, there was a rock. And then there was a large section of debris that was pulled out. So it wasn't a beaver dam. I can, like you said, you never found a lodge. We can talk about what was there as far as evidence of a beaver and just the fact like again I've been there forever and I've not seen anything like that and again my 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 challenge here is is that to say this has always been a complicated project I spent the last two and a half years coming to these meetings saying look this is what they want to do we all know the, the topography we all know the wetlands we all know the structure of what needs to happen how it needs to happen correctly we've been talking about this for two and a half years and the first thing that happens is all of that is thrown away, and the developer comes in, does what they want to do, how they want to do it, until he's kept made accountable by the abutters. And again, there's even a, 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 a history, there, there, and even when he's, this is brought to bear, there's no level of accountability saying, well, we don't know what happened until more information is given by the abutters. And then acknowledgement begins. So I really want to make sure that this board considers not only the, the circumstances, but what is, what, how can we trust this developer going forward? And I th absolutely agree that we should have a third party outside review of this, because based on the individuals and how they've acted, there's no way that we should be able to trust that they can act appropriately going forward. Because like you said, we have very knowledgeable people, very experienced people. I'm sure this is not the first development they've done, yet here we are. Um, <laughs> Again, I guess I could go through a lot more, but I think that really comes down to it. It's like, how did we get here in the first place? And, um, you know, and again, maybe this isn't a certified bur barrel pool, but we've been talking about it for two and a half years. And just for that fact, that kind of puts it into the, uh, the realm of scope. So if I read the regulations, that's, that's really enough to kind of keep that into the conversation and into the planning to make sure things are done appropriately. And um, yeah, I, I think that's about all I have. You have any questions for me? No, we we I just appreciate your concern, and we 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 feel the same way you do. Um, there was a lot of many many meetings about this project, and there were many many concerns voiced about what could happen, and what could happen happened right away before you even did anything. So. Um, I can understand your frustration, and we're frustrated just as well. So uh, Aaliyah was out there, and yep. we're going to have our third party person come out and do an inspection along with them, and he's going to give us a report, and if there's something that needs to be rectified, they'll have to rectify it. Okay. And that's all we can do moving forward, and we'll do that. We, we can do the best they can, and they need to need to do the best they can. Well, that's it. I appreciate that because this is going to be a, a very long project, right? We all understand the scope of it. And, you know, 
us as a butters, it's already a huge, um, you know, it's a lot of asking us to be having to oversight them. Right. And honestly, you know, you don't want to see me. And I don't really, you know, nothing personal, but I don't want to be here. I think we all have better things to do. And, um, <laughs> and I, that, I think that's, yeah, you've said it. I've said it. Um, the whole point is how we got here and how do we not repeat this mistake and how we do this correctly because of the impact is very significant. Correct. I mean, you're talking, you know, everything um, from, you know, from, from it being a borough pool to being a, uh, you know, an aquifer to, to, to being anything you can think of when it comes to wetlands. All those categories apply to this area. So I um, appreciate the board for listening to me. And um, uh, then I guess uh, hopefully we, uh, we go forward and, and we go forward in an appropriate way from here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So actually just one other thing. So under the bylaw, we can charge him $300 a day per infraction. So we did make note of that in the cease and desist. So it's some. Okay. Me again, Rachel Missile, 23 Cypress. Um, so first of all, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for responding appropriately when my neighbor George sent you information with regard to this egregious violation. Um, as George pointed out, we've been talking about this being a vernal pool, the possibility of two vernal pools on this site for over two years. I was attending those meetings until I became critically ill and couldn't anymore. I'm back. You're not you're going to see a lot of me. I asked at the time that people from this commission go and walk that site and it as far as I know didn't happen and that's a travesty. Um, I want to speak to the question of whether or not you received the cease and desist order. I received word on the evening of Monday the 8th that a cease and desist order existed. On Tuesday, I walked my dog down past that work site, the opening to the work site, and there was a giant truck with hay bales. I'd like to be allowed to finish speaking before you interrupt me. I'm not asking for, I'm just letting them know that I do want to speak when you're done. That's all Fair I Fair enough. Saying. Thank so you. So you have the floor. Okay. Please all right. Please Thank you. On the, Tuesday the 9th, I was walking past with my dog. I saw a giant truck with hay bales. I asked what they were doing on the site. The guy there said, I don't know. And he was belligerent with me, wouldn't go get anybody out of the work site so I could speak to them about the cease and desist. When Gordy came out, I spoke with him. He called the contractor and put me on the phone with somebody, I wish I'd gotten the name, who said, I thought it was only site work and tree work that was prohibited. So whoever I spoke with knew about the cease and desist order and to claim at this time that they didn't is disingenuous. Perhaps you didn't receive the certified letter, but there was awareness that, it, that there was a cease and desist order. And I have to object strenuously to being told otherwise. I was present. This is the conversation that took place. So again, I want to thank you guys. Aaliyah, you are my hero right now. Um, I appreciate you working to get this vernal pool certified, and hopefully it's protected going forward. And I have to echo George's comments. This should not be on the abutters. Had George not noticed, had the abutters not noticed and raised a red flag, all of those spotted salamanders, all of those wood frogs would be dying right now because that pool would be continuing to drain. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Well, I think I, well, I, I think you've heard. I mean, all the concerns that we have. This is a very sensitive area. There's been a lot of discussion about this project over many years. So we just hope you take that all in and, and do the best you can not to have this happen again. I would totally agree. What I wanted to say was I, I can understand the residents' concerns, the abutters' concerns. Um, we are addressing them. But at this point, to continue to belabor the point about how this happened, we already told, we've right. already expressed how it happened, the fact that it's not going to happen again, and we just want to move forward and make sure that this goes. 
As far as the third party goes, yeah, I think it's a terrific idea. Um, I work with Art a lot. I don't, of course, Art may send someone else because he's sick of seeing me all the time, but. Well, well no once problem. we get Art out there and we get a report from him, and then a layer will make a determination of what needs to be done, and then when, when you can get going and, and what needs. What okay, good. Then we're, we're definitely on the same page. Okay. Sounds good. Yes, sir. I mean, the word but can't be in this conversation. You can't go in and say that, look, you know, they're right. Use a microphone, boys. Like yeah, you got to come up yeah, here. All right. So, <laughs> I apologize. I don't want to eat any more time. I really sure apologize about, yeah. for this. But that's a, that, that speaks well, to the well, new stuff. Uh, right off the bat, what he goes back to is but. But the story that I told, you know, made it okay. Where the story wasn't accurate, it wasn't true, it didn't re lead to the right, um, right conditions, right actions. That tells me right there that this is not going to change. If he goes from what we just talked about back to butt, that gives me no faith and shouldn't, it shouldn't give the board any faith that this is going to change. This is a project that will take three years of construction. They've done borings, it's all ledge. There's two trenches they cut through with the runoff off of the ledge, right, right into the wetlands, no bales, no nothing. So the butt really pushes me a little bit past the edge at this point, because it again speaks to how do we get here? How do we not get here? And what does he do? Goes right back to the beginning again. So we're gonna, like I say, we're gonna have a consultant go in, gonna do a review, we're gonna get a report, and then we're gonna act on that. And then they can't do anything until we get that and review it. And yeah. Move on. Okay. I apologize for raising my voice, but that that's 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 the whole crux of the problem. I understand. We understand. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. You hear it. You heard it. Will Leo be in contact with you and get that scheduled and then? No, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank yeah, and you. Just, just to clarify, I did email the enforcement order on Monday afternoon at one thirty. Okay. So. Oh, if I could make a request on that, anything with enforcement documentation, enforcement communications, things pertinent to the order of conditions, site inspections, send them to me okay. as well mm -hmm. so I can ensure that everybody gets them Okay. because um, I'm kind of an email fanatic. Mm -hmm. I kind of watch it as much as possible. Monday. Okay. Monday, so we'll, we'll see an email any future Monday, communications yeah. to everybody. All right. Hopefully this doesn't happen again, please. Okay. All right, another 248 Spring Street. Um, this was previously before you. Um, I had, a couple months ago, um, the homeowner had come in to discuss um, the... I can write it down for you anyway. Oh, my gosh. They had been issued a superseding order of conditions um, because they were less than 15 feet from the wetland um, when they had proposed construction. They had increased beyond that. And the homeowner had come in. It, it had seemed like there was a little miscommunication going on. It sounded like he thought someone had given him permission to expand closer to the wetland. I got in touch with DEP because we weren't sure if we were allowed to issue enforcement, if, if it was kind of above our heads already. Um, they said, you know, this isn't the biggest issue in the world. You can handle it. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, it is back, <laughs> and I will be issuing another enforcement order saying, no, you are not allowed to be even closer to the wetland than you were. I'm, I'm not sure if you guys remember the sweet little Arbor Vitae line that mm -hmm. demarcated eight feet from the wetland, um, but it is gone and has been expanded again, so I will be issuing more enforcement for that. Okay. Um, now, would you like certificates of compliance or updates? What, what's... Bobby, what are, you, what are you here for? 190, 198 South Consignment Ave. Okay, doke. So this has been on our agenda for several months. First certificate of compliance. Um, they had uh, revised the plans a little bit. Uh, we have now worked it all out with stormwater and us, um, and the grass has grown. <laughs> that was their big issue holding them up previously was my concern for erosion across the site. Um, they still have an ongoing stormwater permit um, because they haven't finished final grading or final landscaping. Um, and maybe something else final, but it's all in the front yard. So as far as I am concerned, the wetland should remain happy. Okay. So we're good to issue that. So I'm good to issue a certificate of compliance for 190 to 198 South Quinsigman Avenue. Any comments? No. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.
Um, I have one additional certificate of compliance. <coughs> Not for you. You're, you're welcome to go. <laughs> Please, yes, go. <laughs> Be free. Um, I have one additional certificate of compliance. This is for lot nine of Falcon Farms. I've still not heard anything from 11 Sunset Lane, so you can just keep that, keep it on. Um, but um, so lot nine of Falcon Farms, this was a pretty large subdivision off of South Street. Oh, South, South Street. Street. Yeah. Um, this one is like. 400 feet from the wetland it was just included in the order of conditions because um you guys had wanted the whole part the whole subdivision because that's usually a requirement um this one is very far away and it's just a partial release this house has been built it is happy it doesn't even have erosion control because it's not even nowhere near the wetland and so okay drains to other places well. yeah they will have um certificates of compliance coming for several years and um won't be able to finally close out they have a wetland replication area on site um that will need monitoring for the next two years they just submitted their first we planted that um report this last fall so i should be expecting another one this spring and then <clears throat> fall and spring fall again okay um, yeah so that's that and i think that's fine um and then i have updates so I have two requests for extension permits for orders of conditions. Uh, one is for the uh, construction of a pool at 465 Walnut Street. Um, I think with like COVID and just everything, they are just running out of time. So they would like an extension. How long is the extension? Uh, the extension will be for an additional three years. I okay. imagine they will be done before that because I, I think they were planning on construction of the pool this summer. Okay. Um, yeah, they just need a little more because they were going to expire in May. Is that the correct one? No, that's not the correct one. Either. Yeah, because you can't do that one because it's already expired. The locations expired. So oh, there's another one. No, see, that's the oldest one. They've, ex they've oh, extended okay. several times. So the other order of con or the other extension request is um, for. 285-1620 this is for the the um i think it's for the herbicide yeah it's for the herbicide treatment of dean park and jordan pond by solitude um it has been extended several times i think this should be the last extension permitted um before they need to come through again and be like okay this is what we're actually doing um and if there's any updates that need to be made well because jordan pond okay jordan jordan pond Yes. Yeah, huh. Dean yeah. Park and Dean Park. Dean Park. And Dean Park. How, um, how often are they actually treating? Are they going in They annually? check it every two weeks in the summer months. So they just went out for the first time. Uh, so it might just during the growing season, I guess. So they went out for the first time a couple weeks ago. They send me, every time they go, they're planning to go out, they send me an email saying we went, we're going out. And then they send me an email saying we need to treat this or that if they need to treat um if they do not i so i have a whole folder full of emails that everyone can look at if they would like to but um yeah so they they don't they don't treat for kicks they they do treat only if they need to okay. but yeah with this um extent this will be another extension for three years and then i will let them know with this one that so it's also three years? I would advise this is the last time they um, that it be extended because it's been I think it, this order of conditions was issued in 2013 so it's been 10 years time for a fresh do refresh you know why okay I think that concludes my spew just keep going if you want yeah We've got plenty of time. <laughs> Midnight yet. <laughs> Jesus. Um, I have been, pro I did want to circle back. I, um, I've been processing the comments that I asked for MVO several months ago in December. <laughs> and maybe if our agendas get any shorter, we will start to incorporate some learning moments at the beginning of our talks. Um, we could, yeah, we could do, you know, a couple fun species for people to incorporate into their gardens that aren't invasive or non-native um and different kinds of stormwater technology that's fun and innovative but i go to lots of webinars all the time and i need someone to give this information that i'm learning to <laughs> all right
That sounds good. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So move. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.